I'd like to call the um, Senate Finance hearing to order. And it is May 11th, 2020. Thank you very much, everyone, members, for indulging in this um, uh, afternoon hearing that we, we, we're going to execute here. I appreciate that. I'll let you know when we have a quorum. We have Senate file 4564 before us. And um, this deals with the Coronavirus Relief Fund Appropriation for Counties, Cities, Towns, and dis Distribution Authorization. Uh, with that, I am going to turn it over to our Vice Chair, Senator Ingebrigtsen, who will lead the rest of the committee. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, very good. Welcome, everybody. Um, and Senator Rosen, before us, we have Senate File 4564. And you also do have an A2 amendment. Would you like to uh, uh, add that amendment before we get going to the bill? I would. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move the uh, delete all A2 amendment. Okay. We're going to have to go. Uh, if there's no, is there any discussion? Senator Ingebrigtsen, we have a quorum. Okay, thank you. May it be noted that we do have a, a, a quorum. Uh, everybody unmute themselves and give us a, uh, a hey, hold on here. I gotta... thumb up and a yay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Senator Rosen, to your bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, members. Um, the D2 amendment was basically just getting the bill in order to uh, to put in the, the um, percentages that that myself and, and nonpartisan staff have worked on for over a week, probably 10 days close to this. But basically the Senate has taken the lead in figuring out how to thoughtfully distribute the federal funds from the CARES Act that came to Minnesota. And we've had thorough discussions. We've had kind of a three-part series in thinking about this large amount of money that's come to the, to the state of Minnesota. First, we had the coronavirus relief account, which was Senate file 4486. And those that said basically monies in the account cannot be spent without direct appropriation from law. And then last week we had Senate file 4563, which was the COVID-19 appropriations and transfer to the federal fund source, making sure that we get those appropriations from the funds, from the federal funds that we have used general monies for. And this is Senate file 4564, as I said, the appropriation of the coronavirus relief fund for county cities and towns. And that is the uh, amended bill before you today. And that's why it's imperative that we get this bill moving is because as we are marching through the, the end of the week and session is, is, next, is over with next week, hopefully the governor will sign this and get this need out to our, this greatly uh, required need out to our county cities and towns. Like I said, the A2 amendment is the result of a lot of hard work, feedback from various organizations. A letter was sent by my office to a group of local government um, organizations in the middle of April to begin gathering feedback on this very issue. We will be hearing from a few of them in testimony uh, this afternoon. But the letters were sent and feedback was received from League of Minnesota Cities, Association of Metropolitan Municipalities, the Metro Cities, Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities, Municipal Legislati Legislative Commission, Minnesota Association of Townships, League of Minnesota Cities, and Association of Minnesota Counties. So we did gather that feedback on this issue, and that is how this bill has been crafted with that thoughtful response by them. To review a little bit of what, how we came to these percentages and the thought of this A2 amendment, if you remember, the state received 2.186 billion in federal funds. And because of the population of, Ram of Hennepin and Ramsey County, uh, which was a federal designation that it had to be over 500,000 or greater, they would receive a direct appropriation from the treasury. So that amount totaled 317 million. Hennepin County received 221 million and Ramsey received 96 million. And the treasury guidelines basically recommended that no more than 45% of total funds can be used in that local distribution. 
leaving 667 million for the remaining 85 counties with no clear direction whether we need to spend that or, or um, how, you know, how it should be dispersed, basically left as up, up to us. So this bill is really good faith effort at distributing the 667 million fairly among the counties, cities and towns. And we know that uh, the local governments are facing large costs to purchase their personal protection equipment, uh, pay, the, pay their staff overtime, address the worker comp, compensation claims, and so much more there. So this bill is a priority, as the governor said, preparing the entire state is a priority and we need to work quickly to get this money out to all local units of government who need it, whether they are preparing proactively for an outbreak or are already experiencing a high volume of COVID-19 cases. So the key policy approaches with, and then I'm, I'm gonna run briefly through it and then I am going to um, turn it over to Mr. Arneson who, and Mr. Wilms who crafted the language for this. But Senate file 4564 provides the same level of support per capita to every county in the state and bases the distribution on the federal government's distribution of $174.50 per capita. That is what Hennepin and Ramsey received per head. And that's what we're doing for the rest of the 85 counties. This is a base level of funding per capita across the state so that every local government has funding to respond and to prepare for COVID-19. The formula recognizes that cities in Hennepin and Ramsey counties have yet to receive any distribution. So it does this by requiring Hennepin and Ramsey to share their resources with cities in their county. And this is truly a fundamental fairness. Other counties must do the exact same thing with their cities and townships. So again, this is uh, truly a, 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 a formula and a percentage of, of fairness. And as you know, members um, in some counties in the state, you have some that are more urbanized and some that are more rural. And as a result, the government services and the COVID-19 COVID cost are shared in different differing degrees depending on the blend of government services within a county. Therefore, it is important that distribution of money to local governments recognizes that every county and city are not the same. In a county with fewer city, oh, excuse me, the formula in Senate file 4564 attempts to recognize those differences by subtracting the city and the township aid from the initial amount uh, provided each county. And in a county with few cities and towns, the formula provides more money per capita with county level gov government. And in counties where many people live in the cities, the formula provides a blend of resources to the county and to the city and the township government. But in all cases, the county level government receives at least 50% of the money within the county. And I need to repeat that again, the county level government in all cases receives at least 50% of the money within the county. So this bill provides $87 per capita for residents of cities and $25 per capita for residents. And on a statewide basis, 56% of the funding will go to counties and 44% of the funding will go to cities and towns. That's on a average across the state. So with that, I would like to, um, Mr. Chair, if I could ask Mr. Bjorn Arneson to speak to, this, to the specific operations of the formula in Senate file 4564. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Mr. Arneson, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Bjorn Arneson with Senate Council Research and Fiscal Analysis. I'll be walking through the, the text of the A2 uh, amendment. Um, I encourage questions as, as the chair sees fit. Um, Subdivision one gives the responsibility for distributing the, the aid under this program to the commissioner of revenue. Uh, it also provides some definitional language to establish which counties, cities, and towns are eligible for the distributions under subdivision two. And uh, finally, uh, it, it establishes uh, which population count this formula will use for the purposes of calculating aid amounts. And for, uh, for, the, for the counties, that population count is the same population vintage that the federal government used to calculate the allocations to the 50 states and to the counties 
uh, exceeding five hundred thousand dollar uh, five hundred thousand uh, uh, population. That's a 2019 population count. For the for the cities and towns, the most recent um, data that we have from the state demographer is a uh, is a 2018 count, and this uh, is the same count that uh, the Department of Revenue would use for uh, pay 21 LGA and town aids. So th these counts are are already uh, compiled and cleaned and um, and reliable. Subdivision two uh, establishes the formula for uh, distributing the amounts to local governments. Uh, for a town, uh, that amount is the, the greater of uh, $2,500 or that town's population times $25. Uh, so in, in the case of the towns and the cities, there's a sort of minimum floor set um, to provide some base level of, of adequate resources for, for smaller towns and cities. Paragraph B, the distribution amount for an eligible city uh, is the greater of $5,000 or the city's population times $87. Um, and, and I should note that um, uh, eligible town and eligible city in this subdivision uh, mean a town or city uh, uh, whose home county is one of the 85 counties, not including Hennepin and Ramsey. And the, the language regarding those two counties comes later in this, this bill. Subdivision two, paragraph C, um, as the, uh, Senator Rosen indicated, uh, calculates the distribution amount for a county. Uh, that amount equals the county's population times the $174 and 49 cents that Senator Rose mentioned. And then the second operation is to subtract off that initial amount, the amounts generated by towns or cities uh, located in that county. And for the purposes of this uh, subtraction, uh, the population uh, of a joint city uh, that might cross county boundaries, only that population that's located in that county is, is subtracted for the purpose of paragraph C. Subdivision three requires the Commissioner of Revenue to make the aid distributions by June 15th of this year. Subdivision four establishes allowable uses for, um, for the aid under this section. And um, I know that members have probably heard this before, but the allowable uses under, under this bill here are, are the same as the allowable uses in the, in the CARES Act itself. Uh, they have to meet three criteria. First, that there are necessary expenditures incurred due to the public health emergency with respect to COVID. Second, that they were not accounted for in the local government budget most recently approved as of March 27th, 2020. And third, that the expen expenditures were incurred during the period beginning March, 20 March 1st, 2020 and ending December 30, 2020. Uh, subdivision five, uh, one more thing about subdivision four. Um, uh, prior to distributing the aid, the, the Commissioner of Revenue must uh, require each eligible local government to certify that it intends to comply with requirements of, of this and federal law. Subdivision five um, authorizes a local government to enter into a collaborative agreement, perhaps with neighboring local governments or a parent county. Um, to share aid distributions under this section consistent with um, the allowable uses and gives the commissioner authority to uh, request information about the, the form of that uh, agreement. Subdivision six um, uh, governs expenditure time limits for local governments uh, that receive an aid distribution under this section. Uh, paragraph A uh, requires that any aid amount remaining unexpended by the local government must be returned to the commissioner on November 1st, 2020. Subdivision B indicates that for a local government that has entered into a collaborative agreement with other local governments or a parent county, for example, that, that the money is available to that, that local government uh, six weeks longer until December 15th, 2020. And if it still remains unexpended as of that date, then it must be returned to the commissioner and is canceled to the, to the federal fund. 
Subdivision 7 uh, governs how Hennepin County and Ramsey County must uh, share their federal aid allocations with constituent um, cities and towns in those counties. And uh, in, in concept, uh, the aid amounts for each of the cities and towns in Hennepin and Ramsey County are calculated in the same way as, as the amounts uh, were calculated in subdivision two for the, the cities and, and towns outside of Hennepin and Ramsey County. So the, the county has to distribute that aid on the same schedule as the commissioner would distribute the aid to the other cities and towns. And similarly for a joint city having population in both Hennepin and Ramsey, only that portion of the population of the joint city in that county is uh, considered for the purpose of um, a county uh, required aid distribution. Subdivision eight uh, governs uh, repayment of improperly spent federal funds. Um, the federal law provides the inspector general of the treasury to claw back uh, funds from the state or from a local government uh, to which has the, to which had been given a direct allocation, um, if if that expenditure is not consistent with the uh, requirements of, of of the federal law, um, because the bulk of the the CARES funds were were uh, allocated to the state, um, um, the, the this section provides the state a mechanism to recoup improperly spent funds from local governments uh, that would be receiving an aid distribution under the uh, provisions of this uh, bill. Uh, in general, the uh, commissioner must certify the amount to be repaid by each local government uh, to that local government. Uh, the local government uh, within a 90 day uh, period uh, must, must repay that um, amount in full. If, if it's not repaid in full, then that local government um, must make a levy um, in their next uh, annual levy certification uh, in an amount uh, sufficient to, to repay the, the commissioner in full. And the, the proceeds of that uh, repayment are credited then to the, to the fund from which the state paid the federal recruitment amount. And finally, subdivision nine appropriates uh, $667 million from the coronavirus relief account in the federal fund for the aid distributions under this section and provides uh, some guidance to the commissioner if that appropriation um, is um, uh, exceeds the amount required or, or is insufficient of the amount required and uh, clarifies that this is a, a one-time appropriation uh, from that fund. That concludes the, the walkthrough of the bill language, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and I'll open up for questions, but I have a couple right away, uh, uh, Mr. Arneson. The first one is on uh, line 231, the uh, commissioner must certify. How do they do that as far as uh, um, distributing funds or pay or uh, spending funds that were, not, uh, that were not appropriate? And if and when that happens, or if they do not spend it, it goes back into the... Um, um, Minnesota State Treasury. Can you give me the idea, or give me uh, um, an idea of what happens to the money if it comes back to the state or where that goes? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, in, in general, the Inspector General, Inspector General of the Treasury has authority to, to audit expenditures of, of these federal dollars. Um, in, in the case of a local government uh, improperly spending the dollars, if, if the Inspector General determined that that because because that local government uh, spent it on things that were not allowed under the federal law, um, it, it's it's possible we think that that the state itself would be subject to a recoupment because the state itself was the first recipient of of these uh, dollars from the federal government. Um, the The idea of the repayment is that. Uh, if it, it possible, it should be repaid to the to the to the uh, coronavirus relief account in the in the federal fund. But depending on the timeline of the inspector general's findings, it's um, and perhaps Mr. Nauman has more to add here. But but it seems likely that that the inspector general's findings wouldn't be um, 
made known immediately or even shortly after the December 30th um, expenditure cutoff, at which point the, the state itself um, may end up having to pay recoupment amounts from the state general fund, in which case the, the repayment from the local government would, would then be credited to the, to the general fund itself. So we tried to make it a the language a little bit flexible and not specify the fund to which the local government repayment uh, would have to be credited because it's not quite clear from which fund the, the state recoupment would be paid. Right. Uh, one more question and I'll open it up. Um, the uh, eligible town you're talking, you're talking there, I think my, my description is the township. Is that correct? For these smaller townships? Because you have town and city. Mr. Chair, yes. Um, for, for members that are familiar with town aid, um, that, that's, a, that's an aid under chapter 477A uh, in current law. And the, the aid is, is for towns that are, that are essentially organized, um, organized towns. Uh, I think of the township as a, as a geographical area. I mean, we have unorganized uh, territories, um, but, but the town itself in this context is the town government. It, it's it's a, an established local government. Uh, in unorganized territories, those those areas may be um, uh, well. Th in those areas, wouldn't have a town government directly representing them. So, the towns in this con in the context of this bill are the exact same towns that are eligible for other local aids under Chapter Four Seventy Seven A uh, under current law. Okay, uh, members, any questions of Mr. Arneson? Before we move on, we do have uh, four testifiers, so. I have a question. Senator Champion. Mr. Arneson, uh, I was listening to you going through the bill itself, and, and I have a particular interest in all of it, but, but uh, uh, specifically subdivision, I think, seven. I think that's where the Hennepin and Ramsey provision is. Is that right? Mr. Arneson. Mr. Chair, that's correct. That's subdivision okay. seven. Um, and Mr. Arneson, I naturally assume that you've also had an opportunity to read the treasurer's guidance, uh, which I think the last one was updated as of May 4th. Is that right? Mr. Arneson. Uh, Mr. Chair, yes, all of our staff has read that guidance. All right. And, and so champion. particularly, uh, as it particularly uh, uh, pertains to the guidance itself, uh, isn't there on page two, which I want to understand this, and perhaps this might be a question for the author, but isn't there on page two of that guidance that it, that there's a question that's asked, is a fund payment recipient required to transfer funds to a smaller constituent unit of government within its borders? Wouldn't you agree that that particular question would probably be for like a county, like in this instance with Hennepin and Ramsey County, where money was directly uh, given to uh, those counties, first of all. Uh, would you agree with that before I go to my next question? Mr. Arneson. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I apologize. I, I lost the middle part of Senator Champion's question because of my internet here, but but I think I get the gist of it in that the, the federal law itself doesn't require that a county government transfer funds to a, a constituent smaller level of, of local government. And so that's really what I was getting to, because in that guidance, it says that um, that that the question was asked whether they would be uh, uh, required to transfer such funds to a smaller constituent unit of government within its borders. And if there are cities within the borders of Hennepin and Ramsey County, uh, the federal government has says no, uh, that there's no requirement to do so. And in fact, wouldn't you agree? that in their answer, they also provided an example that says a county uh, recipient is not required to transfer funds to a smaller to smaller cities within the county's borders. Isn't that right? Mr. Arneson. Mm, Mr. Chair, I, I think it's right that the federal law doesn't require a county to do that, but we don't find any evidence that the federal law prohibits, uh, uh, prohibits a state from, from requiring that. Uh, so, so, Mr. Uh, Arneson, you would agree uh, that 
that under federal law, there was, there was a specific criteria that needed to be utilized in order for that money to be sent directly to uh, those counties that meet the, the uh, well, it could have been a city, could have been a county, could have been a township if they reached the uh, magical number of 500,000 uh, people or more. Is that right? Mm, Mr. Chair, yes, the, the federal law did directly allocate money to local governments that exceeded the, the $500,000 uh, 500, person uh, population threshold. Uh, and I'll have some questions later, Mr. Chair, because I think that there are some other specific questions that I have about the uh, bill that is before us and uh, 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 things that I think n need to be clarified. Oh, but there is one thing. Uh, someone, um, the chair asked what happens if a government uh, is given money or, or a local unit of government or county is given money under this um, uh, uh, bill, uh, and those monies come from the federal government, like the CARES Act, if that local unit of government does not spend the, the money consistent with the, the uh, federal government, at the end of the question, we being the state would be on the hook for that money especially if the local unit of government has an inability to pay. That would now be drawn from our uh, general fund and there would be a levy or tax upon the uh, 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 local folks. Is that right? Mr. Arneson, real quickly, then uh, Senator Rosen. Um, Mr. Chair, you know, I, I think the only thing I can offer about that, and perhaps Mr. Nauman has more, but um, I'll offer that the, the federal law and guidance gives the Inspector General of the Treasury authority to recoup uh, improperly spent money. And, and it's true that any money that we don't spend consistent with uh, the CARES Act or money that we have left over does not stay in our coffers. It goes back to the Treasury according to the guidelines. Is that right? Mr. Chair, the, the federal law requires that the funds be, that the that the expenditure be incurred by December 30th, 2020. And any amounts that don't meet that criteria would be subject to return to the federal government. Senator Rosen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, perhaps at this time, it would be good to have Mr. Nauman give clarification on what the, net, the Treasury has, um, has given guidance on. Mr. Nauman. So, Mr. Welcome. Chair and uh, Senator Rosen, I, um, Treasury has offered both guidance as well as a collection of question and answers in response to a variety of fiscal staff, both at the executive branch level and the and uh, and at the legislative level. We've been asking questions for the last little month and a half, and one of the questions that that uh, I think Senator um, Champion is getting at is, and I'll just I'll just read it to to members, this is on page two, is a fund payment recipient required to transfer funds to a smaller constituent unit of government within its borders? And the answer is no. Uh, for example, a county recipient is not required to transfer funds to smaller cities within a county's borders. And so to me, that, that in a sense begged the question of well, whether um, um, a state government could in fact require um, a uh, direct recipient uh, and what I'm talking about here when I say direct recipient is a is a, a local unit of government in a state that received a direct distribution from from U.S. Treasury. And uh, about two hours ago, the National Association of Legislative Fiscal Officers had a phone call with U.S. Treasury. And we asked that question directly. Is a state precluded under federal law or the guidance from um, requiring a direct distributed local government from sharing those resources with its constituent lower levels of government? The answer was no. So my view is, and to reconcile these two provisions, is that um, the federal law doesn't require it, but nor does it preclude it. And, and so I think that that's how I'm currently thinking about it. And to Senator, um, to Senator, uh, Champion's earlier question, the, the phone call dealt at some length about the question of whether or not um, the, uh, the money had to be actually spent. And in, um, in all cases, um, 
the, the counselor to the Secretary of Treasury said that yes, the money had to be spent. And if it wasn't spent, there would be a debt taken out against either the local government or the state, and it would be expect to be paid back to the US Treasury. I hope those points are on point for what was being discussed. Senator Cohen. Senator, are you there? You, Chairman, you bet I'm here. Okay, there you are. I was having a lot of trouble on, uh, going, I'm muting my whatever it is. So, um, so <laughs> I'm, Mr. So glad I, I'm so glad to hear that. You don't even know. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm, always, I, I'm, here, I'm here to amuse you. Uh, so Mr. Chairman and, and Mr. Nauman, um, I was struck by your response to Senator Champion's question because it, in this instance, the federal government has through statute given money to Hennepin and Ramsey counties. And you've suggested that the discussion with the U.S. Treasury was that there's nothing to preclude. Well, lots of things are not precluded. Um, federal statute does not preclude me from, I don't know, uh, putting a tightrope across the Mississippi River and walking across on the tightrope. That's not precluded. But has there ever been a situation where a direct appropriation has been made by federal statute, which then allows some other entity, in this case, a state government, to then act in a way that makes a demand on the local government? Um, I'm sorry, it makes a demand on the local government receiving the money, to then disperse it further. I, I've asked for some research to be done, uh, some legal research, and you can find nothing, uh, no precedent for something like that. So I don't know if, Mr. Nauman, if you want to get into a discussion of some of the legal aspects of this, or Mr. Bodden has some further help on this. Uh, but my legal opinion is that Mr. there's nothing to preclude it necessarily. But there's no precedent for what's being done with this bill. Mr. So, Nauman, did you did you understand the question? I noticed when uh, Senator Cohen turns his head, it, it kind of moots it out. So did you get did you get it all? Um, Sorry, Mr. Chair and Senator Cohen, I I got all of it, but I did I do think that I I got the gist of it. Um, not having gone to law school, all I can do is report <laughs> what the, um, the the counselor to the Secretary of Treasury reported to us in the phone call not two hours ago. Okay. So the question that was directly put to him was. Is there anything in the CARES Act or the U.S. Treasury guidance that prevents a state from requiring local governments that receive direct CRF distributions from U.S. Treasury to allocate that distribution to other local governments? And the answer was no. Um, so, yeah, I, so, Mr. I, Chairman, that's Mr. All I can Nauman, for you. Senator Cohen. Okay, so, Mr. Nauman, I'm not trying to ask you to practice law because that, <laughs> Thank that you, is Senator. absolutely precluded by state <laughs> statute. Um, so, Mr. Chairman and, and Mr. Nauman, who, who were you talking to, if I can ask? And what was that person's position? Uh, is it counsel to one of the divisions in, in the U.S. Treasury? Who, who were you talking to? His Nauman. name is, um, it's, a, it's a kind of a Minnesota name, uh, in a sense. It, his name is Dan Kowalski, and he's listed as the counselor to the uh, Secretary of Treasury. And he participated in a National Association of Legislative Fiscal Officer meeting um, or a telephone call um, at two o'clock this afternoon. And we had a list of about 30 questions that were all related to the coronavirus um, relief fund. And this was one of many. And I report it here only because it's on point to the discussion that um, is directly relevant to this bill. Senator Cohen, any follow-up? Otherwise, uh, Senator Hayden. Um, and can I ask a question on this point, Mr. Chair? Uh, one second. Senator Cohen? No, no, go ahead. To that point, uh, Senator Champion. Uh, Mr. Nauman, when you were talking to uh, uh, this uh, person from the Treasury, did you ask as a part of your questions, because it sounds like there's a number of questions that you had or others had on the line as well, did you ask whether it was the federal government's intent to have counties to distribute their funds to local governments? Was it so, their so intent? Mr. Mr. Chair, and, Mr. Chair and Senator uh, Champion, I think the guidance answers that question for you that um, he, uh, 
you know, the question wasn't answered that direct in, in that way for the simple matter that the guidance on May 4th that you cited earlier answer, I, I think answers that question. No, the, the federal government didn't specifically require it to be transferred. But as I said earlier, his answer was that nor did it preclude a state from doing what Senator Rosen's bill is attempting to do. Okay, Senator Hayden. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair and um, uh, Senator Rosen for bringing the bill. I think that there'll be a lot of questions along this line, but to the point of uh, Mr. Nauman's call with the federal government and there were a list of questions that I don't know what, was there any nuance to the issue? Because I think in our, uh, I think what's gonna get teased out here is we've had municipalities that have large population centers uh, as in St. Paul in Minneapolis that may not have reached the threshold of the $500,000 or the 500,000 people that the counties had to get a direct appropriation, but they're, they're fairly close and they're you know, the majority of those counties uh, population centers. Was there any question of A, like what the, why they picked the 500,000 or B, if you're in a unique situation like us where we have large cities that fall just under the threshold. I, I, I wasn't involved and I'm just trying to get a sense of what the federal government was thinking and if those were questions that were raised in your call with the treasury. Um, Mr. Chair and Senator Hayden, in this particular call, that question um, was not specifically asked for the simple reason that it was written into the federal act in itself. So that was a requirement that if you were a local government that had a population of 500,000 or greater, you were made eligible by the federal law to apply directly for a distribution from the, from the US Treasury. That's just a simple, straightforward language in the, in the bill. So it wasn't one of those nuanced questions that fiscal staff throughout the country were interested in trying to spend our 45 minutes with the, with the, the Treasury official getting, uh, trying to get answers and clarification. Senator Hayden, you're on, you're on to mute yourself. All right, I'm trying, sir. I'm, I'm there you go. picking up. I'm picking up the Dick Cohen itis on this deal. But anyways, um, well, well, that's good. I, I you know, I've, I've been called the king of nuance uh, in, in many a circle, so I didn't know if in those conversations that just a side talk might have been that. I, I think we'll get into a lot more of this, uh, uh, Madam uh, Chair or Mr. Chair and, and Senator Rosen. But I just was just trying to get some sense of kind of what the conversation was on a national level. Thank you so much, Mr. Nauman, Mr. Chair. And Mr. Chair. Senator Rosen. Thank you. If I could just uh, quickly respond before we go to the testifiers. Yeah. Um, this, this was dictated, the, the, uh, the questioning of the nonpartisan staff is interesting because uh, there, there is uh, guidance from the federal treasury to the point where we have crafted this bill and then there is no guidance thereafter. So um, trying to keep it fair and equitable for everybody was dictated about by the, um, by the application from Hennepin and Ramsey because they are over the 500,000, which equated to $174.50 per head, which we feel it doesn't matter if you have large cities in the county or not, or, or, or it just depends on that population of that county. And that's how we treated the entire state uh, with this formula. So hopefully we can get into the mechanics of the formula and how it serves um, the highly populated cities, high, highly populated counties versus the rural areas. But um, I know we do have some- well, If I may, Mr. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, oh. Madam Chair, I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, I'll follow up, uh, Senator Hayden. Well, well, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Chair and, and, and Chair Rosen. I, 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 I totally understand it. I was just, you know, and, and I respect whatever the federal government did, but I wonder, like, in states that have counties that have high that that would have over that would have reached the 500 th threshold, the cities and the county. Like, I was just trying to get a sense of what that would have looked like in other. Uh, places. I mean, I imagine we're going through the census now. There's a lot of growth. Um, we can't, we don't know that for sure. And, and I don't want to throw that in, but there's a tremendous amount of growth in the core city. So I was just trying to figure out if you were, you know, a city, Los Angeles city has X amount and Los Angeles County got Y amount, like how would they have handled that? I was just trying oh. to get a sense of it. Mr. Mr. Chair. 
Oh, hold on, hold on. Uh, Mr. Nolan. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, to that point, I don't want to get in front of the, the author, so if she needs to speak to that, okay. I'll step back. Senator Rosen. No, I was just going to say, um, Senator Hanley, Mr. Chair, is that the eligible county is under a 2019 census, and the cities and the towns are 2018 census. That's our current information we had. And like I said, uh, Hennepin and Ramsey just got a direct appropriation from the federal government, nothing different than, um, Mr. Nelman told me uh, last night that uh, New Orleans did not get a direct appropriation. They did not reach that 500,000, which I found really interesting that uh, you would think they would have been eligible for that direct appropriation, but they weren't, so. Uh, Mr. Chair, can I ask uh, the, the author or Mr. Arneson a question related to the same line of discussion? As soon as Mr. Uh, Nauman is done answering, Mr. Nauman, did you have anything to Mr. Um, so Senator I believe Hayden? Senator Hayden was curious about how U.S. Treasury, Treasury would have handled the circumstance where, for example, you can imagine uh, New York uh, State has maybe maybe even California to think about this, where the Los Angeles County was made eligible, but the city itself was also in excess of 500,000 population. How would they have handled that distribution? And um, and U.S. Treasury has provided quite clear guidance on that, that both the county that has a population in excess of 500,000 and a city that has a population underneath that county would have uh, would both be made eligible for a direct distribution. But what they what they would do is is not essentially double the 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 allocation. So they would subtract this, they would both be eligible to apply directly to the to US Treasury. The city would get its allocation based on its population within the city. And then that amount would be subtracted off the county and it would be then directly distributed to the county. So for example, if you can imagine a circumstance where maybe there was in the county 750,000 population and a city inside that county received, had 500,000. So the allocation would be based on the 500,000 for the city, and then the county would receive the corresponding 250. That's how they would handle it, and it's based on the guidance. That's 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 helpful Senator to know. Thank you, Mr. Nellman. Oh, sorry, Mr. Chair. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Nellman. Senator Champion, to that point, to Mr. Yes. Arnson, and then we're moving to Senator Cohen, yes. and we're going to go to the testifiers. Sounds good. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for your patience. I really do appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Arnson, you were go when you were going through the bill. Uh, and I'll come back to the chair's notion of fair and equitable because uh, once the testifiers testify, then I'll talk to some of the differences that I see in the per capita rates uh, that I don't think I, I always very fair, but maybe there's something that I'm missing. But to, to this point, Mr. Arneson, are the funds that must be returned on November 1st eligible to be uh, dispersed to a local government that might be in need of those uh, monies because they ran out? And, and secondly, that's one question. And then let's say that there are fun, funds that come back on November 1st because those counties didn't have, cities, counties, whoever, didn't, didn't meet the threshold notion of having COVID-related expenses, then would, under this bill, then would Hennepin and Ramsey County be eligible for those funds? Mr. Arneson. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Champion, I, you know, I, I think any funds returned to the coronavirus relief account in the federal fund would be eligible for use in the normal way um, uh, under under the, the 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 laws governing that fund. Um, perhaps the the chair has more to offer about why those local government return dates were set in advance, but I think in, in concept, what we don't want is for funds that could otherwise be put to productive use to be clawed back by the federal government under any circumstance. And Mr. Uh, Chair, Mr. Chair, to, to respond to that, uh, Senator Champion, uh, that's right, uh, Mr. Arneson, we originally had the date of October 1st and it was brought to our attention by by the associations that they need a little more time to make sure that they cover their expenses, and as Mr. Arneson said, if 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 those aren't if, if they don't use the money that goes back and it is eligible for 
um, for other counties to apply for those dollars. So, uh, 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 so Mr. So Chair, and to this been, question, oh, I'm sorry. Really, really short because we're going to go to. I know it's short. We're going to go to testify. It's, so, where in the bill uh, can we find the language that says that Hennepin and Ramsey or any other would be eligible? Because, from my understanding, the allocation in this bill went to the 85 other counties and excluded Hennepin and Ramsey County because they got a direct appropriation. And 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 so I don't see that in the bill. So maybe someone can highlight that for me so that I can at least have that comfort that if there's some money that comes in because the other local municipalities did not use it, the Hennepin and Ramsey, who uh, seems to be uh, hemorrhaging when it comes to spending money for the COVID-related uh, 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 challenges, would, would would be in a position where they could apply. Yeah, I'm going to ask the staff look that up and be ready to to answer that right now. I'm going to go to Senator Cohen. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll be very quick. So, uh, first, let me make it clear, Senator Rosen. I had the chance to spend uh, some time with Mr. Nama. In fact, he graciously gave me part of a Saturday evening to go through your bill. And I don't know that my concern is so much. Uh, I have some general concerns, but in terms of the, of the dollars, I'm not sure my concern is with. Um, the formulaic aspect of it, but I do think there are some significant legal issues that none of us can answer. I mean, Mr. Nauman has not convinced me about this discussion with an unnamed U.S. Treasury official. Um, I, I just think uh, we set ourselves up for some difficulty if it's determined we're in we're countermanding uh, a federal statute which appropriates money to Hennepin and Ramsey County without suggesting there's any ability to then reappropriate on the part of a state legislature or a state government. And with the importance of, of this, I would hate to see a situation where arguably you get tied up in federal court. So I, I, I'm not convinced uh, by what Mr. Nauman said he heard this afternoon. I'm more convinced with my reading of, of the federal statute and my interpretation as provided me uh, through legal counsel. Um, so oh, I just wanted to make that, that comment. Thank you, Senator Cohen. And, and as far as being unnamed, there was a name. I, Nelson, if you can hold for now, the testifiers have been patient here for nearly an hour. So well, if I could go through those first. Well, Mr. Chair, if I could just put my question out there because I think the testifiers might be able to address it. And sure. I'll be yeah, glad yeah, to discuss the question later. But right now I just want to put the question out there. And the question is, um, it seems to me that counties have uh, a great amount of uh, public health. That, that That's kind of who runs the public health departments. And I'm wondering, um, are, are counties being treated equitably? And well, what about cities of the first class? I'm kind of looking at cities of the first class and counties that have a city of the first class within them. And are they tr being treated equitably? Uh, because of course the needs are similar uh, based upon uh, size and often where those uh, residents reside. So that's my question. I'll listen for the testifiers. Thank you. Thank you, Thank okay. you Senator. And we'll get back to that question. Now. Thank you. First, first of all, we're going to start out with the Department of Revenue Commissioner, Cynthia Barley. Are you here? Good evening, uh, Mr. Good evening. and members of the committee. My name is Cynthia Bowerly. I'll just pause for a moment to make sure that you can all hear me. I can hear you and welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Chair Rosen. Thank you for the opportunity to address the committee uh, about this proposal. Um, as you, as you, we all know, there the pandemic has hit Minnesota uh, across the state, uh, and these federal funds are welcome news to help provide some response and help with the costs of some of those. These federal funds are delineated in the statute to be used only for the costs necessary to incurred during the public health emergency uh, and were not accounted for the budget most recently approved as the date of the enactment. So the statute provides us with some guidance and, and as Mr. Nauman uh, well knows, uh, the guidance from Treasury uh, to give us more detail is changing uh, and updated uh, frequently. Uh, and so I do hope as a result of the call that was that happened with Treasury today, uh, they provide some more Q and A's to all of us so that we can have written guidance uh, to this. I know that's a frequent uh, pattern with respect to some of these calls with national organizations and the Department of Treasury. So um, we have been setting that as well. Um, 
And as Chair Rosen said, there is, uh, this really is up to, uh, a lot of this is up to the state. There are specific uses for the money and how uh, money is distributed in the state is really up uh, to the state. And so we are uh, really grateful for the opportunity to work with all of you uh, as we uh, consider how to uh, move this money. There are a number of areas where we are working with the legislature on issues related to our response to COVID-19, including small business loans uh, and grants that are being worked on right now, uh, testing and tracing needs, uh, some of them, uh, uh, of course, being borne by the counties. Uh, as uh, Senator Nelson mentioned, counties play a significant role in our public health area, our public services, our human services, as do the cities that have their own public health infrastructure. Not every city does, but many do. Uh, and so those are the uh, costs that I think that this money uh, from the federal government is, uh, is wisely spent uh, to, to uh, fund. Local governments are and will need to continue to play an important role in our statewide response going forward in our response to these, uh, pandemic, this pandemic. And it's already hitting many communities across the state hard, including, as we know, in Nobles County and Stearns County, just as examples. And we need to support those communities at this very difficult time. So the administration shares the goal of moving a portion of this money out quickly uh, and making sure that this distribution is uh, allocated fairly to ensure that those uh, with the most need are able to do uh, the work to do to support their residents. Uh, we know time is of the essence. Many local governments have already spent significant funds in response to the pandemic. And so we are happy, uh, look forward to working with you quickly uh, to move uh, a proposal along. There are a number of considerations for local distributions uh, that I would like to just mention and uh, for the committee's consideration. Um, first, uh, while we know time is of the essence, we do not need to distribute the funds all at once. There's nothing in the guidance that would require us to do so. Uh, and so we know that this pandemic changes every day. And so it may be wise to push out a portion of the money uh, quickly and then because we will know tomorrow, then we too today about this pandemic, reserve some portion of the funds for a future distribution uh, as we uh, learn more about the changing situation, where hotspots are, and to use those funds most effectively and efficiently. Uh, turning to the question of a formula, uh, I think uh, there are many formulas in Minnesota statute. Of course, the, the Department of Revenue administers LGA and CPA. Uh, formulas that may not be, that are, are fairly complicated. Um, Mr. Arneson would be an expert on that. They are uh, rather layered and complicated. Um, this formula uh, is uh, one that I, as we study it, uh, we have some questions about some of the results. Um, and I think some of that comes from re that uh, reliance on uh, the uh, removal of, from the county share, uh, the amount provided to other local governments within the county's borders. Well, I understand and, and uh, acknowledge that that is the approach that the federal government took. It is, it is not certainly required that states follow that when it comes to distributing funds uh, to local governments. Um, first, I think it's important to note that counties serve all of the people within their boundaries. Their services do not stop where a city or town order starts. Uh, and in many cases, the types of services provided by local units of government are different. For example, many counties are the primary provider of health and human services to its residents. As Senator Nelson just mentioned, the public health function uh, is, uh, is held by, uh, by counties and by some larger cities and is not universally uh, a service provided by smaller cities or towns across the state of Minnesota. And so uh, there may be different needs when it comes to those. I wanna be really clear that local governments all across the state of all sizes are providing essential services and have been challenged by this pandemic. And we support the work of all of the towns, cities and counties as they serve their residents. This is always the case and is especially so now. We do have concerns, however, the result of the formula in this proposal uh, create some unusual winners and losers. And while it's likely true that any formula uh, would have that, have that result, the results here bear further re review and reconsideration. 
The proposal places reliance on a local government's decision about whether to charter itself as a city or a town and minimum allocations. A charter decision by that local community was certainly made for reasons other than pandemic response. Nonetheless, the formula in the proposal results in this scenario. A city with 47 residents will receive the minimum $5,000 allocation. A town with 99 residents will receive the minimum allocation of 2,500. And another example, a city with a hundred, I'm sorry, a city with 10 people would get $5,000 and a town with 200 people would get $5,000. And so I think that there are uh, this result, which is dictated only uh, in this formula by the charter choice of whether it's a local government is uh, a t an incorporated township or city, uh, rather than uh, necessarily by population or by need as a response to this pandemic. Another example is the uh, treatment, the disparate treatment of counties based on the type of local governments within them. So a county with only cities within its boundary would receive $87 per capita, but a county with only towns within its boundary would receive 149 per capita. And so this uh, results in a little bit of an unusual situation where we have uh, large needs in areas like Nobles County and Stearns County and Hennepin County the three largest uh, numbers in terms of total uh, and total um, cases of coronavirus receiving uh, less per capita than the three counties to who at this point have no cases. So for the three counties with the largest numbers of cases, Hennepin, Stearns and Nobles, they will receive uh, a range of 87 to $103 per capita and the counties where there are zero cases uh, will receive 134 to $147 per capita. Uh, and so I think that these, uh, there, this lack of correlation to any differences in the services provided to the residents or needed or needs for the funds uh, uh, should cause us to revisit uh, some of this formula. Um, we know that the pandemic has caused serious issues across the state of Minnesota and local governments have incurred significant costs. Uh, but again, they can vary based on the local government and the services they provide. Some governments have health departments, first responders, others rely on other jurisdictions of the state to provide those services. One way to reflect the differences in these services is to divide up the pool of funds and distribute some based on population within a jurisdiction and others based on costs and needs faced by the jurisdictions based on some of those priority services during uh, this pandemic. Um, this is different than the approach taken uh, in some other aid areas uh, where the funds are available for general reuse like in LGA and CPA. These funds are target, must be targeted to only costs related to responding to the pandemic. And certainly, uh, as we know from hotspots right now in Stearns and Nobles County, uh, those there are counties facing uh, more, uh, more costs. Uh, and again, that will change as we move forward as uh, more, uh, more cases are known and more needs are felt by Minnesotans. So we, by providing an initial distribution based on per capita numbers of residents within each jurisdiction, in the near future, we can help all jurisdictions across the state of Minnesota. We could then reserve a portion of the pool to work together to provide a targeted approach based on needs and costs focused on health departments, uh, the testing and tracing work that will need to be done, uh, other, other areas that we know we will need to continue to fund over time for law enforcement, et cetera. Uh, and we could target those to those most in who, has, who have incurred most costs. Uh, it's also uh, has been discussed by the committee already. It is important to note that the federal funds must be spent pursuant to those requirements set out in statute and the guidance uh, and will face review by the inspector general. And so we will need those local governments. Every uh, unit of government who receives these federal dollars will need to maintain appropriate records for review by the IG. Uh, and uh, as the bill provides, uh, ensure that they can repay any disallowed costs. 
Uh, and as, uh, as uh, Mr. Nauman, I believe, mentioned, uh, perhaps it was Mr. Arneson, I apologize, uh, that review can happen well into the future. Um, those reviews can take place, um, you know, years into the future. And so that clawback could happen uh, in, in a number of years rather than a few months after the funds are to be expended. So as we move forward, uh, Mr. Chair and Madam Chair, I, we look forward to working with the legislature to create a distribution that fairly allocates funds to Minnesotans impacted by COVID across the state. Thank you for the time today. I appreciate it. And I'm happy to answer any questions if members have them for me. Thank you, Commissioner. And I'm going to go with the testifiers and hold the questions till we finish, if uh, that's okay with everybody, if you can indulge me. Uh, we first have up the Association of Minnesota Counties, uh, Matt. Milgart, are you there? There you are. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good evening, Mr. Chair, Mrs. Chair. Um, I'll get started. My name is Matt Hilgart. Uh, I work for the Association of Minnesota Counties. The Association of Minnesota Counties represents all of Minnesota's 87 counties. Firstly, I want to thank the chair, uh, Chair Rosen, and the Senate for pushing forward a proposal to get CARES Act dollars out to Minnesota's local governments. Starting as early as two weeks ago, you, Madam Chair, stood up on the Senate floor reminding senators of the financial impacts this virus was having on local government budgets and the importance of getting these funds out to locals, as was the clear intent of Congress and President Trump. We appreciate your acknowledgement of that, your support, and your action as seen here today. It is important to get this money out as counties are already realizing costs as they relate to COVID-19. While not all counties have realized the same impacts, there are certain core truths. Like cities, counties, and local governments in general have experienced general costs related to remote work infrastructure, personnel costs associated with new FMLA leave mandates, and any increase, uh, experienced increases in public safety personnel over time and personal protective equipment purchases. In addition to these immediate personnel, safety, and infrastructure needs, Counties have unique roles and needs as they relate to local public health outreach, social safety net programs, house, housing and food supports, corrections and probation, and even the operation of financial support of hospitals. While not all counties have realized identical impacts in these areas, it is expected that costs will continue to increase proportion, proportionally on county services as the economic hardships created by this public health emergency are more realized. To the bill specifically, the formula included in this bill apportions out a direct per capita aid to county and then subtracts from it any applicable city per capita and township per capita. AMC is asking that any formula proposal is fair, transparent, simple to administer, and has clear guidelines for acceptable use. I'd also like to leave you with a few items for consideration as these discussions move forward. Firstly, we would appreciate any negotiated final language to be clear that counties are not mandated to serve as the administrative agent for any local jurisdictions fund. A direct appropriation from Department of Revenue seems like the most efficient way to get these funds out, and we appreciate that this is embodied in the A2 amendment. Secondly, secondly it may be worthwhile for the legislature to consider what would happen in future hotspots or outbreaks. Right now, the bill appropriates the entire $667 million sum out in June of 2020. While AMC is not necessarily opposed to this, there is an important policy consideration to weigh in terms of what would happen if the community experienced some sort of unanticipated cost related to a postponed crisis, let's say in October or November. While a bit more administratively complex, it may interest the legislature to look at some kind of two round payment schedule where a majority of the fund was directly appropriated in June, but a reserve emergency fund would be available for unanticipated needs later in the year. AMC also stresses the need for continued clear guidelines for permitted use of funds. With the magnitude of the funds and the current federal flexibility in use, it is critical that the legislature and local governments are clear on expectations. We know these conversations are ongoing and that clarity will likely come not only from the state, but also federal guidance. Lastly, we appreciate that, that this bill directly appropriates money to local government as soon as June 2020. Regardless of the allocation methods this body agrees to, it is imperative that these funds be released as soon as possible so as to provide clarity and assurances to local governments on financial decisions they are making as we speak. Again, Senator Rosen, we appreciate your proposal's attention to this. One point of contention, as you probably expect, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, 
AMC does not support the provision included in this legislation that would require the counties of Hennepin and Ramsey to reallocate their di already di issued direct appropriations from the government. As you are aware, these appropriations were directly issued under federal law. Moreover, these counties have already spent significant portions of these monies. In all honesty, they're expecting more costs and revenue impacts than these funds will likely accommodate. I want to be clear that that's not to say AMC, along with other local governments, aren't frustrated by the fact the original CARES Act did not address other local governments, but that decision was a federal decision and completely out of our hands. To rewrite the rules for these two counties does not seem fair or justified considering the extraordinary costs that they have encumbered on behalf of their residents and the state in general. Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, in closing, I want to recenter my testimony on the majority of this bill and applaud you for your work and for the work that is going on behind the scenes with various other stakeholders in the House and with state agencies. I would hope that you continue to lean on your local government partners to help provide input as this bill takes shape. With that, I thank you for the time afforded to me today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hilgard. Appreciate that. Uh, next, we'll go to the Hennepin County uh, Commissioner, Jan Callison. Good evening, Mr. Chair. Good evening, welcome. Madam Chair and members. My name is Jan Callison and I am a Hennepin County Commissioner and I am grateful for this time tonight to speak. In the interest of time and in light of the seriousness of the pandemic, I want to be very clear and direct with you. We have significant concerns with Senate file 4564, which takes a totally inadequate approach to this very complex, unique situation, deploying a per capita formula in complete disregard for the virus's disparate impact on certain communities. The result is that counties with zero cases would receive substantially more per capita than counties that are in the front lines of this struggle. Specifically, Cook, Hubbard, and Lake of the Woods, the three counties in Minnesota which have zero reported cases to date, would receive between $134 and $147 per capita. Nobles, with the third highest number of cases in the state, would receive $100 per capita. Hennepin, with one third of the cases in the state and two thirds of the deaths, would receive $83 per person. I cannot explain this result from the standpoint of public health, economic impact, social services, or quite simply, fairness. Can you? In our opinion, this bill represents an unprecedented overreach by the legislature. Counties, cities, and towns receive direct awards from the federal government all the time. Hundreds of federal programs are set up with this direct allocation method, and the legislature does not interfere by telling local governments how they must distribute their awards. That is the province of the federal grant-making agency. Why start this intrusion now? We are, after all, in the middle of a global pandemic caused by a virus for which we currently have no cure. Something is wrong when the legislature affirms our role as the local public health authority, but siphons off the funding that we need to fulfill that responsibility. This proposal makes no sense. Moreover, the CARES Act places a tight timeline on how fast we must spend the funds. We took that to heart and have already approved a spending outline and allocated dollars. The money is going out the door. Your bill, however, would force us to reverse all of that. While I believe Commissioner Carter will talk about the liability concerns we share, I will just say that the bill's timeline leaves us no space to negotiate 45 liability agreements the number of cities we have in Hennepin. Even though your bill will force us to send our award elsewhere, we, we maintain the liability if it is misspent. That was a condition of our award. I want to take a moment and educate the committee on some of the ways we are already using our CARES Act allocation. They include $17 million for small business relief, $15 million for emergency housing assistance, $5 million for testing and supplies, and $5 million for emergency shelter care for persons experiencing homelessness. But this is an initial response, a phase one. We are also considering ways to target funds toward county involved youth and nonprofits, all of which are particularly at risk under this pandemic. In addition, just last week, we instructed staff to develop and immediately begin implementing a plan to support testing and intervention at long-term care facilities. We are not waiting for the state to act to meet the needs of Hennepin County residents. Senate file 4654 puts all these interventions and supports in jeopardy. Some numbers may help you understand the depth of our concern here. We have one fifth of the state's population, but we have one third, as I said at the outset, of all positive COVID cases and two thirds of all COVID deaths. 
48% of all hospitalized patients in Minnesota are in hospitals around Hennepin. Many of the long-term care facilities where the COVID deaths are occurring are in Hennepin. These statistics are incredibly alarming to my colleagues and to me. They should be equally alarming to you no matter where you live or whom you represent. Behind each statistic is a person, a beloved member of someone's family or community. Finally, I want to talk about our hospital, HCMC, part of the Hennepin Healthcare System. I will remind the committee that the county has a statutory obligation to support the financial vitality and viability of HCMC, the state's largest public safety net hospital and level one trauma center for adults and children. HCMC is projected to lose $111 million this year in unbudgeted COVID related expenses and lost revenue from the suspension of non-emergency medical treatments. That number may sound familiar, it is the number that Senate fiscal staff projects would be Hennepin's net award should this bill become law. Should this bill pass, then we will be put in the position where we will have to choose between our residents, businesses, and the hospital. This hospital should be important to most members of this legislature. Why? We stepped up to do COVID testing several weeks ago. 45% of our COVID tests are for non-Hennepin residents. People from 46 counties, including Blue Earth, Rice, Ottertail, Sherburn, Wright, Meeker, Sibley, and Stearns. Over a quarter of our inpatient COVID cases are from non-Hennepin residents. Our COVID ER visits come from Anoka County, from Beltrami County, from Brown County, from all around the state. We provide COVID-related care to constituents of every member of this committee and most of the legislature. We are proud of this asset. We are proud to share it with Minnesota's 5 million residents, but we cannot do it when you jeopardize the federal funding we are using to fight the pandemic. I think we can all agree that despite our service on different levels of government, we need to be partners in how we respond to COVID-19. For us, being a good partner means that we step out where we should, lead where we can, and collaborate where we ought. So we let legislative leaders, the governor, and our local government partners know that we would not ask that the county be factored into funding formulas as a state decides how to distribute its direct award under the CARES Act. Cities and towns inside and outside of Hennepin and Ramsey and our fellow counties around the state should be funded from the money Congress provided directly to the state. We are not asking for any additional CARES Act award. In closing, I cannot say strongly enough our opinion that this bill is a legislative overreach that threatens the timely and effective distribution of CARES Act funding, hampering the ability of local government to respond to the needs of communities that are most at risk from the virus. The bill sets us up to be adversaries. My fear is that it is our residents and our businesses that will suffer and the state itself. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, for that testimony. Uh, next, we have Ramsey County Commissioner uh, Board Chair, Tony Carter. Thank you very much. I will just hold for a second, Mr. Chair, to be sure that you can see me and hear me. You know, I can, yes, go ahead. I think everybody can hear you, yes. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, and members, Tony Carter, Ramsey County Commissioner and Chair of the County Board. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. We do appreciate the efforts to get funds out to the counties and to the cities who did not receive direct federal allocations in the CARES Act. This funding is unprecedented, we know, from the federal government, and we're all figuring it out together. Our staff and likely yours too have been working with the Treasury Department to better understand what this can and what it cannot be used for. We do have grave considerations with subdivision seven of the delete all amendment. It spells out that Ramsey and Hennepin counties must make allocations from our own CARES federal funds to the municipalities in our county. And we ask that you remove this portion of the bill and pay for any city grant with the state's allocation. As the home counties to the urban core cities, we are tasked with addressing immediate needs and challenges that much of the rest of the state does not have. Congress chose 500,000 in population as a cutoff for this reason. Most pressing right now and for the foreseeable future is our increasing homeless populations. That includes those who are sheltered and those who are unsheltered and living outdoors in encampments. 
we have plans already to start spending these federal dollars on dire needs. I am sure you can agree with any disaster situation, getting the money out to the public is of utmost importance to keep the economy moving and also to support individuals. We received our funds on April 22nd and just last week, our county manager presented a plan to spend 56 million of our 96 million in three key areas, 26 million in financial services. This is direct assistance, financial assistance services provides to individuals and families to focus on core needs of those struggling due to the impacts of COVID-19. It includes critical supports like supports for families to maintain their housing, purchase food and basic needs, and also provide additional cash assistance. 15 million will go to business assistance. According to data from the Department of Employment and Economic Development, 66% of Ramsey County businesses are small businesses with 10 or fewer employees. Additionally, between March 16th and April 16th, the Minnesota Unemployment Office received nearly 50,000 applications for unemployment representing 17% of the Ramsey County labor pool. Our business composition relies most heavily on small businesses. And it is critical that relief efforts reach as many of our small and minority owned business enterprises as possible. Thirdly, 15 million will go for workforce assistance with unprecedented unemployment rates across our nation. We're being asked to serve many people that have never interacted with our system. And we need to better address the needs of many communities that were not being served well prior to the crisis. To do that, we plan to invest in building capacity and workforce solutions, including increased access to employment supports and services and increasing and improving virtual training opportunities. I also need to highlight that the $40 million in remaining CARES funds that have been allocated to Ramsey County is necessary for us to continue our emergency response. As you know, many services and supports in Minnesota are state directed, but county administered. And these services are also critical now. They include personal protective equipment, public health essential services, direct community engagement, housing, direct care services, public safety, sanitation, and many other costs that were not anticipated in the Ramsey County budget and are a direct result of COVID-19. To date, we've already spent over $10 million or 25% of the remaining funds. Finally, this bill would create administrative work as a mandate on the county in an already stressed time for our executive staff. By issuing an allocation to each city and township, we would be responsible for how they use this money and for auditing as such. This is new work that sets up an unnecessary structure for our two counties when the state would be doing that work for the other cities and counties. There are limitations, of course, to what CARES funding can be used for, and our staff would be responsible and our county liable for that. Cities do not deliver social services in Minnesota, counties do. Ramsey County is moving significant resources with unprecedented speed to ensure that individuals, families, and businesses most in need receive them promptly. We're collaborating and we're meeting with other jurisdictions in our county to holistically address these issues. We will continue to do that. And we ask that you delete subdivision seven of the bill so that we can move as quickly as possible to meet the needs of all our community. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much for the testimony. Um, and finally, we're going to end up uh, with our last testifier, uh, uh, Mr. Massman, Matt Massman from uh, Inner Minnesota Inner Cities, or in his, in, in our Cities, I believe, yes. Hi, Mr. Chair and members, Matt Mossman. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members, for the opportunity to testify on Senate File 4564. I am Matt Mossman. I'm Executive Director of the Minnesota Inter County Association. Uh, MICA is uh, 14 member counties 
which together represent over one third of Minnesota's uh, residents. And I want to just really start by uh, thanking you, uh, author and Chair Rosen, for bringing this legislation forward and really for bringing attention to the need to allocate a portion of these CARES Act stabilization funds to local governments and doing so with some urgency. These funds are available, as uh, we all know, for costs that are incurred uh, through December 2020 only. And so it really is in the best interest of both state and local governments that we get these monies out the door and that we optimize all available federal funds uh, to support Minnesota and Minnesotans during this pandemic crisis. So we really appreciate, uh, again, the urgency of prioritizing this for legislative action uh, to be taken by May 18th. The stabilization funds cannot be used to replace uh, lost revenues based on existing uh, guidance, but they can and should be used to ensure that COVID-related costs being incurred by all counties are fully paid for without being shifted to property taxpayers whether those property taxpayers live in cities or in townships. And the funds should also help ensure that state and local budget stability is achieved by funding eligible expenses that might otherwise uh, be funded from what are now declining uh, revenue sources. It's not a general purpose aid, but many of the COVID related expenses are common to counties and cities. And some of them, most of them have been mentioned before like PPE, uh, required uh, paid leave, uh, cost to facilitate work from home for employees, and cost to facilitate social distancing. City police and county law enforcement and other first responders is another essential service uh, with a high risk exposure to themselves that is common. But most of the eligible expenses in dollar terms are likely to be for payroll and program costs incurred in several of the functional roles that are specifically cited in federal guidance. And those payroll and program roles include public health, public safety, as I mentioned, for police and county law enforcement, healthcare and human services. And this is perhaps the largest cost area, such as the massive effort to facilitate social distancing, isolation, program enrollment, and services for vulnerable populations uh, during the pandemic. And finally, costs to facilitate health, safety, and operation of county jails, correctional facilities, and probation services. To get a relative sense of where those functional roles and costs lie, uh, we reviewed uh, state auditor data from the most recent year available for 2018. County spending accounts for roughly three quarters of local expenditures across those four areas. And it's consistent really with what we're hearing from our member counties. Usage of telehealth systems in the Bloomington, uh, pardon me, in the Blue Earth uh, area have increased over 2,300% uh, since the beginning of the outbreak. St. Louis, Olmsted, Dakota, Stearns, and other counties are leasing hotels and incurring millions of dollars for facilities to house at-risk residents. Micah counties are providing emergency rental and food assistance, and have incurred significant costs with the rapid transition to move uh, quickly to a remote platform for facilitating health and human service programs. And COVID healthcare costs for inmates are on the rise at Arrowhood Regional Correctional Facility in uh, St. Louis County. Finally, Madam Chair and members, a few specific observations that I wanna touch on as you move forward to consider what the options are. The proposed allocation model uh, generally results in higher per capita allocations uh, to less densely populated areas and lower per capita amounts to more densely populated areas. Again, I just wanna pause and say, I think that we are all in this together as Minnesotans. It's a challenge, it's a crisis, and we need to find uh, an ideal way uh, to get these monies out the door quickly and to make sure all related costs are covered. But I think the current approach at least has the potential on the front end to significantly misalign uh, the allocation of the funds to where the COVID specific uh, county government costs are arising and are likely to arise. And it potentially exacerbates uh, the final per capita uh, differences among uh, counties that incur similar uh, costs because of the functional role that counties play in the state of Minnesota. Just a few thoughts might be to 
um, tweak the proposal such that after allocations to cities and townships, that the remaining amount is distributed across the state on a single per capita basis for all counties. And another idea that we would support that has been mentioned by the Association of Minnesota Counties and others would be to create uh, two pots such that we get money out the door now and allow for true ups and to address county cost impacts that frankly continue to surface and accumulate as the virus spreads and particularly to respond to local outbreaks. Whatever the allocation model, uh, I think it's uh, important and we, we urge final uh, allocations be reflective of two things. First, that all of the county's uh, governments should receive funds sufficient to fully pay for similar types of costs and to pay for those costs secondly at a commensurate level of service uh, so that we're providing both budget stability and preventing taxpayers uh, from having property taxpayers from having to shoulder the burden of the COVID crisis. And I think at its core, that was one of the key uh, important uh, criteria and reasons for the COVID uh, CARES Act stimulus funny money in the first place. In short, Madam Chair and members, I think that the uh, per capita approach has uh, the benefit of being simple uh, on the front end to get money out the door will we potentially look for a way to reallocate uh, funds at a later date in the calendar year if we established a, a hold account for some uh, amounts of money to be distributed later. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members. Again, I uh, appreciate uh, your leadership on this and bringing uh, what is clearly uh, not an easy um, uh, issue to, to figure out and keep everybody happy, but very important to the state of Minnesota. And so I appreciate your leadership and effort in bringing this issue forward and championing it on behalf of local governments. With that, Madam Chair and members, I'm happy to stand for any questions. Mr. Massman, thank you very much. Uh, the first one we're gonna start out with is uh, Senator Benson. Senator thank you, Benson. Madam Chair. Um, and Mr. Mossman, um, you said something that, um, about distribution till all costs were covered, we're, we're not gonna be able to do that. Um, there just isn't enough money. But if, um, if our commissioners could respond, if, if they get money, for example, for housing the homeless, are they also going to apply for the state grants? Because we did allocate money for quarantining homeless in hotels, and we are going to be allocating more money for um, public health testing uh, and, Tra and tracing. And so I'm just wondering if the counties who are engaging in these high cost activities are going to be reapplying, are going to be applying for state grants. If Senator Rosen modifies her formula, will you be applying for additional state monies? We'll go to uh, Hennepin County Commissioner. Um, would you like to answer that? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and Senator, the answer is that we would be applying for those funds. Um, we are not applying for additional CARES Act funding, but we don't expect the CARES Act funding will, will completely um, take care of all the costs that we are incurring. So if we incur more costs for housing and we're eligible for those funds, we would be applying for those. And Mr. Senator. Chair and Ms. Callison, so for example, as you get more cases, there would be more public health money available. And so I heard you talk about the money you're spending in public health, which I understand and I've spoken to several public health agencies. And so I just wanna um, call out that while we might be adjusting Senator Rosen's formula, if, um, you know, if it's the committee's will and if she wants to um, do that in her bill, but it, while we have to keep balance, I think what she's trying to do is create a solid base. And then as needs emerge, there'll be more state dollars coming in to backfill some of those things that you talked about, housing the homeless, because as they test positive, they need to be put somewhere. And yes, we have been relying on the counties. There was actually money pushed out in March and um, in early March in order to help with some of that housing and and there's more money listed in the testing, tracking and tracing bills. And so it's not that I think Senator Rosen's being unfair. I think she's trying to allocate a base amount and then state dollars can come in and flex based on demand instead of preparation. And um, 
response so far. And so I just wanted to be clear that there is another giant pot of money that's going to be specifically for hotspots um, and so forth. So I, I appreciate the um, two largest counties and the unique burden that you bear. I know that you also collaborate with partner counties in public health response if you get overwhelmed, um, that they step in and, and help support. And so I wanted to um, just be clear that if we can get a good solid base for the work that's been done so far and the base work that needs to be done as hotspots emerge and as more tests, um, as more hospitalized cases emerge, there is other money, other pots of money available. Mr. Chair, may I say something? Sure, go ahead, Commissioner. Um, I, I think our view is that the federal government has created that solid base. That was the whole purpose of the allocation and the direct allocation to Hennepin and Ramsey. So we're talking about a solid base being established across the state. We think that's appropriate. Um, but then beyond that would be the other allocations that might be that might come into play. So I think the direct CARES Act allocation is the base that you're speaking to, and that's why it should be, remain in Hennepin and Ramsey the way the federal government intended. Okay. Senator Nelson, you've been very patient. Senator well, Nelson. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Oh, I appreciated the, the testimony and that kind of sharpened um, my, my questions. And I just would add a, a couple things that one, um, I'm, I'm very glad that uh, Senator Rosen has taken this up early. It is important uh, that we get um, funds to where needed soon. But, um, and after listening to the testifiers and then thinking about um, my earlier questions, the things that are important to me are that number one, yes, the money gets out quickly, but it gets out to where the need is. That's one thing. <clears throat> and then it also needs to get out to the proper jurisdiction that is being the most impacted by um, additional costs. All of our local, our local units of government, whether it be city or county, are going to be facing property uh, less uh, property taxes because of extensions and such. But um, so I think it's important to get the funds where the need is and also to the proper a jurisdiction that provides those services. And then um, I didn't hear much talk about cities of the first class. We only have a few of them in this state, but it seems that um, an equitable treatment of those uh, would, would be um, essential because uh, oftentimes that's where uh, we we see the greatest need. So I guess those were my comments, and I'll look forward to um, uh, visiting with Senator Rosen as things uh, uh, continue um, and as we um, work to actually do our best to to help all of those um, local units of government fulfill their duties and uh, serve our joint constituents. Who would like to answer that question? Mr. Chair. Commissioner, go ahead. Thank you, Ramsey County Commissioner. And I just wanted to, on that point, Chair, that Ramsey County and the city of St. Paul share the public health function together. And so we have been working and planning together. Clearly, the city and the county have different roles and responsibilities. However, just as we are working for our entire county and being the public health organization collaboratively with the city of St. Paul, we are able to do our work effectively across the county as the public health agency and for the city of St. Paul. We are certainly concerned that St. Paul did not receive a direct allocation and know that it also needs funding to do this work and its special role in appropriation. But for the public health role, Ramsey County does perform that for the city of St. Paul. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, now I have Senator Hayden. Senator Hayden, are you there? Good, good. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm still got dick eyes. Um, um, Mr. Chair, um, I, I just want to kind of highlight as I was listening to the complexities and the layers of each county and their relationships to the city and listening to Mr. Mossman, um, what I, what I, you know, I had a chance to talk to the city today because I really did want to dig into kind of 
what they're doing that is COVID related and the counties, counties have clearly talked about the work they're doing in sheltering people um, who have uh, healthcare issues, unsheltered people, folks that exhibit uh, uh, COVID related um, symptoms uh, and all of that spin that they have. I also wanted to just get a sense in my city, Minneapolis, what they were dealing with in their public health uh, systems and working with Hennepin County. And they were talking about the work around PPEs for their first responders, because they're you know, primarily responsible for that, working with community-based organizations uh, in terms of the work that they need to do to get out. We're not gonna get into the, not, not gonna drag the contract tracing in, because uh, that's a different conversation for Senator Vincent and Rosen and what that looks like in communities. Um, but there are uh, functions that they are really doing to keep communities safe and keep the public safety. And Mr. Chair, you understand that. First responders, uh, our local police departments and fire departments and others that are responding. So a lot of the work that they're doing is different uh, than what the county is doing, though they're working in coordination. And so um, when you have large municipalities that are inside of large counties, uh, I guess I'll be redundant and reiterate that there's just a much different uh, function and level of complexity when you do that. That is a lot different than when you have smaller counties and townships and unincorporated places. I certainly recognize the hot spots that go around in greater Minnesota um, in deep rural where Senator Rosen's from, where we need to really focus in and highlight and make sure that they're okay. Just not sure that that's where it needs to be all across the state. So Mr. Chair, I guess what I'm trying to say is um, I, I just want to affirm the, the our great county commissioners and, um, and Mr. Mossman and others that are working uh, across the board to recognize that not all counties look alike and not all counties are the same. Uh, and that in the larger cities, they have a responsibility uh, that is different than what the counties do. Uh, and though they're working together. The last thing I'll say is I thought about Senator Benson's comment, and I was trying to work my way through some of this housing issues of the sheltering uh, folks that uh, potentially exhibit um, the, the the COVID virus, sheltering people that are medically fragile uh, versus rental assistance uh, and others. Those are all buckets that are about um, uh, 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 housing, but they're much different. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say, and I know Senator Franzen has been working hard on this, is that there's some people that are not eligible for whatever reason uh, for some of these funds and, and cities are stepping up and counties are stepping up because they, uh, as we've seen in greater Minnesota, are um, you know, not, not uh, immune to the disease. And if they get it, everybody gets it. So I just wanna uh, highlight and affirm the complexity of what happens, especially when we get in our larger municipalities and counties. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, thank you, Senator. And we have next up, uh, Senator Cohen, then Champion. Senator Cohen. Chairman, thank you. I wonder if I could direct a couple of comments to uh, Senator Rosen. As, as you know, you and I have agreed on uh, some uh, Mr. Chair, can we just ask Senator Cohen if he'll keep his head straight because when oh. he goes to the side, yeah. uh, we, we certainly can hear the wisdom and the eloquence of what he's going to say. And, and I am always in an, uh, wait in anticipation of what he's going to say, and I really would like to hear it. We are right. well, always, we are always Mr. looking. Mr. Chairman and, and uh, Senator Champion, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the written transcript of my remarks will be available tomorrow if you miss anything. So, um, so uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, understand that admonition. Um, if I could just, I started to say to Senator Rosen, uh, as off the legislation that I've worked with Senator Rosen on, on a number of things. And, and uh, I know during this year's session, uh, on a very broad level, we agree uh, for the need of, of the legislature to re retain some oversight over how we spend state dollars. Uh, so it's not that I'm always in disagreement with Senator Rosen, but I do think this legislation, there are some things that, that bother me, if, if I might just suggest, Mr. Chairman. Um, and Senator Rosen, you might recall last week, at the start of the week, I asked you, uh, in terms of what you were working on, was this going to be uh, based on a per capita uh, distribution or a needs distribution? And, and I told you at the time that that uh, I understood the difficulty in maybe looking at a needs distribution, uh, although listening to the witnesses, uh, it's very clear that that needs to be taken into account. Let me just offer, if I might, um, 
some, some broad concerns. Um, the biggest appropriation we make is the school aids bill. And that's based entirely on needs. It, as Senator Nelson knows, that's based on a per pupil formula. It's not based on um, a particular school district. It's based on how many students in the particular school district. So it's based absolutely on the needs of a school district in that respect. Um, this, however, I think doesn't take into account uh, the very unusual needs. Now it's possible later on um, if there's more federal uh, legislation, uh, you know, another appropriation, the discussion is appropriating money uh, and I don't know how much support there is in, in DC for this, but there's certainly some support. Appropriating money based upon lost revenue uh, on the part of cities or counties. And, and that would be more appropriate than I think what we're doing right now. For instance, we, we've heard from a lot of our colleagues uh, during the course of the session about, and, and, and to be honest, Mr. Chairman, if you allow me, we heard the discussion uh, this afternoon on the Senate floor relative to uh, how some parts of the state are not impacted like other parts of the state. And if you look at the county by county uh, distribution of folks who have gotten ill, um, Kitson County has had one person. Uh, Lake of the Woods has had one person. I think, I'm not sure, I think Lackville Parle has had one person. And uh, I, I mean, my county distribution in front of me, I, just would, I apologize. I should know the geography better as to the uh, the county that's directly west of uh, Kitson. I think that has one person. That's and North Dakota. That's North Dakota? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sorry. That's right. I, I was so what, so what, born so, and raised. You're talking <laughs> Roseau County. Roseau, okay. Rosso would be Mr. East Chairman, East. For, uh, I actually used to know all my counties along with all the presidents, but um, so, Mr. Chairman, uh, Rosso County, I think, has one person. Sorry. Um, but those numbers have not changed. Uh, whoever got ill in those counties, uh, that's been the case for three or four weeks. And yet we have a distribution to some of these counties. It's in the city, I think, uh, $495,000. Lake of the Woods with zero cases is getting $543,000. And so it just strikes me as somewhat inequitable to argue on one hand, we need to open up our state in terms of businesses because we don't have the concerns and, and the degree of illness in a number of other counties. Um, but in this instance, we want our money. There just seems to be an intellectual inconsistency relative to that. Second, um, even putting aside the uh, discussion offered by um, Commissioner Carter and, and Commissioner Callison in terms of the two particular counties, and obviously I come from Ramsey County. Um, we can certainly look, I, I think Commissioner Bowerly um, uh, talked about some of the particular counties that have significant problems that are smaller counties. Uh, if you look at the number of people who are ill in the state, Ramsey County is actually only number four. Hennepin obviously is number one, but uh, Nobles is number two and Stearns is, is number three. And Nobles County, uh, I think is, let me take a look at the list. No, you can't, you can't. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to grab my paper. Uh, Nobles County, I, I think is eligible for about 2 million. But they are the, the county that has the second largest number of, um, uh, of people who've been affected. I had a discussion with Senator Weber a couple of weeks ago, uh, not relative to this legislation, but just generally what he's, what his uh, county, what his area is going through in terms of Worthington and Nobles County. He indicated, for instance, at, at the plant uh, in question, the meatpacking plant, there are approximately 70 languages spoken, uh, if I remember what Senator Weber told me. He also talked about the fact that there are a number of people in a family who have somebody working both at the Worthington plant at the, and at the Smithfield plant in Sioux Falls, compounding the problem. And uh, with community spread, uh, you know, are you quarantine uh, hundreds of people who work at that meatpacking plant? That would seem to suggest that a place like Nobles could get 
significantly more money than many other places in the state. So I think there's some inequities. I, I think that's accentuated, obviously, in, in different ways in the cities. And just to speak for Hennepin and Ramsey, um, I'm not sure, and I'm, I'm not a public health expert, but I would guess some of the hospitals most affected, you know, Ramsey County and St. Paul, Bethesda Hospital, which has now been turned uh, by Fairview, the Fairview system, into an entirely COVID hospital. And so when you talk about the personal protection equipment, uh, the needs of healthcare workers, the entire hospital, just a couple blocks from the Capitol, is uh, a COVID hospital entirely, every bed. Um, North Memorial is, is doing a significant amount of work, but there's probably no hospital in the state that is more ground zero in terms of public health than ACMC. Um, it's the largest public hospital, obviously, in Minnesota. Um, and because Hennepin County has so much by way of illness and, and, and tragic death with, with, with uh, this pandemic, I can only assume that ACMC is, is at the center of so much. So, Mr. Chairman, I don't know if Senator, Nelson, uh, Senator Rosen would like to respond to some of my concerns or wait till she's heard from, from other members of the committee. But as I've thought about this, I, I just uh, am thinking that there are some inequities throughout the state relative to this kind of a distribution system. Chair, uh, Chair Rosen, would you like to uh, make a comment now or wait till after uh, everybody's done? Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Cohen. I think I'll just wait till after everybody's done. Okay, um, next, okay next I have uh, Senator Champion and then Nelson. Senator Champion. Are you there, Senator Champion? I am here, Mr. Chair, sorry about that. I was trying to uh, uh, get back into my phone so I could actually put in the number in order to speak to you. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, I have a couple questions, and uh, thankfully, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Senator Cohen, uh, in his thoughtfulness, you know, sort of laid the groundwork around some of the things that I wanted to ask. Now, it's my understanding, and I want to make sure that I'm verifying these numbers, uh, because this makes sense to me when I hear numbers. Um, maybe the Department of Revenue can, can help me or someone else on the line. Is my understanding, based on the formula that is being put forward, that Hennepin County would have a per capita number of 87.84, Cook would have 147.81, and Lake of the Woods would have somewhere around 145.34. Is that correct, first of all? I'm sorry, who was that question? Department of Revenue, perhaps, could, could help me with that. Okay, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator, we are uh, we read the runs that were prepared by committee staff in the same way that you do. Um, I would, of course, always defer to expert committee staff on the on their own runs. Um, but well, that's how we read it. Well, can we ask staff to verify that information, and then I have a couple questions from that. Mr. Chair, go ahead. Um, Mr. Chair, yeah, yes, the. The per capita figures that Senator Champion cited are the per capita figures for county governments under this bill. And can you help me understand uh, if that's true before I get to my next question, uh, where the fairness is in, in that and how was it determined that that should be the per capita uh, allocation to uh, the individuals or the counties that I just mentioned? Mr. Mr. Arneson, can you answer that question or would you like? Uh... Um, Mr. Mr. Chair, I can explain how the formula works, um, but the, the the per capita allocation for a county government, as has been noted earlier, is is essentially a function of the amount of money that the the city governments and town governments in that county are generating under their own allowances. So, in general, a, a more urbanized county where, where most of the population is in cities, the, the county government is going to retain less of their initial distribution amount under, under the formula. Senator Rosen, to that point. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Champion. Yes, that's a question more directed towards me as far as the fairness piece, because um, 
uh, that is exactly how this formula does work on a fair fairness basis that everyone, every head in this state is $174.50 ahead. And the formula as it's based and how, how government works uh, in the metro versus the rural area is where you're going to see that, as you say, a disp disproportionate share towards the county or the city. Um, in the rural area, you're gonna see more money going towards the county because there's less people in the city. There's more spread out through that county. And in Hennepin County, it's going to be more in the cities and less to the county, but it's all the same amount of money per head. So there is definitely a fairness piece to this. So, and, uh, and, and at, and this, I'm sorry. And at the rural area, this, the county takes care of a lot of the services. We've touched on that uh, briefly. There is a, a large responsibility coming for the county to those for the services throughout the county. And whereas in the Metro, it's more of a blended type of service between the county and the city. But uh, Madam, oh, is the same. Senator Champion, follow up. You have a follow up, but I didn't mean to to step on uh, uh, Senator Rosen. What happens with this, with this system, I'll tell you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, Senator Rosen, with that being said, but isn't fairness more than just numbers? Uh, when you think in terms of Noble, Stearns, and Hennepin County, uh, that has more of the rates of infection, and this particular pot of money from the CARES Act really is to help deal with the COVID issue. Uh, and those... Um, counties that I mentioned, Noble, Stearns, and Hennepin County receives less per capita than those that, that has no cases. So it, if you look at no cases, we're talking about Cook, uh, uh, that would receive somewhere around, I just want to make sure I'm getting these numbers right, 147.81. Uh, Lake of the Woods would receive 145.34. And it's my understanding, even though I heard Senator Cohen said that uh, Lake of the Woods or Cook had one case, but it's my understanding they have zero cases. So help me reconcile that thought and idea around this money is supposed to be used for uh, 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 helping these cities and counties and local municipalities where there's a need. And we can clearly see that certain counties are bearing more of the brunt when you think in terms of their population being uh, infected and those that have less infection uh, appears to be getting more money. Help me reconcile those two thoughts. Senator Rosen, then we're gonna to go to Senator Nelson. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Champion. I believe when you're talking about the bill, Senate file 4564, you need to look at all the runs, not only just the county run, you, look, you need to look at the city run um, and the town, town or township run. And, for Ramsey, they have wiped their township. So they have, they do have one, one township. And that, that when you blend that all together, that is the 174.5 per capita. Um, so it is equal across the board for every single county. It's just the disbursement um, that is different. And it really does fit well with the level of government that is um, blended between the city and the county. Um, and your other question is, you know, whether they have, uh, there's a, a case, there isn't a case in Cook County. We don't know what's going to happen next week in one of their nursing homes. We have no idea what's going to happen. This is not funding to solve everybody's issue. This is, as Senator Benson hit, and I mentioned too at the beginning, this is base level funding. This is to get everybody prepared, it's preparedness funding. Um, it is not to solve all the issues and make and create winners and losers. It's so these counties of all levels can be prepared because you, we, and you, Senator Champion, mentioned on the floor today, one Minnesota. So it's not very fair to, to say that Cook County deserves less than Hennepin County because these people are less important and, they're, and they may not have an issue, but they need to prepare for an issue or a case and even if it's one, five, or a hundred, just like Martin County had in Southern Minnesota, it's an extreme pressure on their um, public health system and their, um, their first, first responder system and their entire system as a whole. So we are just providing a, 
a, um, a, a foundation for them to be prepared and to manage um, COVID cases because as the governor has said too, it's coming. And uh, whether it hits uh, uh, next week or it already hit, or it's gonna hit this fall, it's coming. Um, it, uh, just to that, Mr. Chair, the be, before you go to your next person, just to this point. Um, Real quickly, because uh, we were running yes, out of Yes, I will. I understand. Senator Rosen, you know, you are a, a, a very important one to me. And you know that we both share one Minnesota. And I don't, and I really mean it when I say one Minnesota. And, 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 and when I think in terms of fairness, you know, I think in terms of, uh, and maybe I can use this, this quick analogy of my two sons. I have two sons, both, one is named Jalen and one is named Miles. And even though, you know, right now they're living under the same household uh, because one, as you know, is going to your alma mater and had to come back home March 25th and the other is a junior in, in high school. Notwithstanding that, um, I, 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 when it comes to addressing their needs, I address their needs and not necessarily buy one. Uh, if I'm gonna buy one a pair of shoes, I buy another pair of shoes. I don't do that because one may not need any shoes. The, the other one may need a backpack or may need some, some new something else, but it's about need. And so when we just give, give kids, or even in my analogy, family, the same thing, just, at the, uh, just for the sake of saying we're giving them the same thing, we're not really addressing their needs. And, and I really would hope that this bill would do that. So the, the question I would have for you, Senator um, uh, Rosen, if we allocate all the money right now, based on this formula that I'm not quite comfortable with at this point, how, how will you deal with future outbreaks? So if money's all allocated, now we have hot spots, more cases are coming, there's a, a certain uh, county, it could be Cook, or it could be some other county, that now gets an overwhelming number of new cases and we don't have any more money available because we distributed it all. How will you deal with future outbreaks? Okay, Senator, Senator Rosen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Senator um, Champion for that question. That's a very good question. And I actually did not answer your very, very first question about um, subdivision six in paragraph B, um, as far as the amount that's unexpended by any local government uh, comes back on December 15th and enters, and then the commissioner, um, then it's canceled back into the CR, um, CRF fund uh, or account, I should say. And then any county is eligible for that, that federal funding. And perhaps that's an area that we need to, to tighten up for with. But that is if the monies in, in any county that, um, and they have not been able to spend them, that would go back into that portion. The other piece is we, we're, we tend to, in this, this discussion, um, we tend to feel like this is all the money that we have. This is the portion that we are spending that the federal government said we can spend up to the 45% of the federal funds of the 2.1 that we received. So we still, even with the, the money that went to Hennepin and Ramsey and with the full 667 million that would get us to that 45%, we still have around 885 million remaining in the CARES Act. And that is something that we need to deal with ongoing, but that is something we can be fairly, um, we can hit the hotspots, we can hit those special needs. As I said before, this funding proposal, Ms. Jennifer, 4564, is just a preparedness base level funding. Senator Nelson. And folks, we're running into the two-hour yep. mark here, so. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Know. I'll be very brief. Uh, and I almost hesitate to bring up education funding because it is so complex. But I will say, I think there are some things that we could um, perhaps learn from that, like the basic per pupil formula is the same for every kid in the state, no matter where they live, no matter what school they go to. But then there's about 12 different categorical fundings on top of that that are based upon 
need. And so um, I would say before you get too scared about that comment, you have two Cracker Jacks that understand uh, education funding uh, right at your disposal there. Uh, Mr. Dahman and Mr. Arneson, they absolutely know how those uh, formulas work. And um, the one thing I would, that I've been asked for that I've not been able to get yet, which I think could be really helpful in our discussion here, is per capita. We should be knowing the number of cases per capita, whether it's city or county. And I've asked that uh, a number of times now and um, have not been able to get that um, from the department. I think that would be helpful. We also should be knowing deaths per capita for city or county. That's going to help us drill in on the need. And we also should be knowing uh, lost revenue per capita. That can help us drill in, uh, drill down as well. And we should also be knowing what are the incurred expenses per capita. Those are things that are in my mind that I think could could help us uh, moving forward. But again, I, and so it's looking at. In my mind, I see a little equation here. The need equals the increased cost plus the lost revenue. Um, and that's, I, I guess, what I came in thinking. Um, now, if this is a just the fund about preparedness, then maybe that's a little bit different. But again, I am so uh, glad for this hearing. I think it's a, a very um, insightful discussion. And um, we do have those three education bills wrapped up now. And I'll be glad to, to work with uh, Senator Rosen or anyone else as they further um, as we further drill down on this, but thank you for the good conversation. Thank you, Senator, Senator, Senator Hayden. Good. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I know time is afoot. Um, I just want to, you know, obviously thank Senator Rosen for bringing the bill and the lively discussion. You know, I was thinking about this issue around, um, e you know, equality and equity and like the difference, because I get mixed up sometimes on that. And I kind of pulled up something I thought worked. It said equality generally refers to equal opportunity at the same levels to support all segments of society. And then equity goes to step further and refers to offering varying levels of support depending on the need to achieve the greater fairness of the outcome. And so I know we've all kind of seen that. We're all trying to wrap our heads around it. And so I don't care where it is in the state. And I'm very sensitive to some of the outbreaks that have happened in greater Minnesota and our ability to be nimble uh, to get the resources there. Um, but um, the, the discussion about giving everything on a per capita basis or just to be uh, equal or to prepare, you know, obviously we need to since, you know, put some money back to the champion kind of spoke to that. But the other thing we need to do now is to really figure out where the money needs to go um, and where are, the, where are the cases, because that's what the money is for and to make sure that we do that. I don't care if it's in Nobles County, Hennepin County, Cook County or any other county in this state, uh, Brown County, if you will. Um, uh, no, no matter what, we, we need to be able to figure that out and be surgical uh, in our approach to this. And I appreciate Senator Rosen wanting to make sure that we have some structure um, and accountability to this shit, I, I, to, to this to this stuff. Um, and and I want to make sure that when we're, you know, whatever gets there, whatever we figure out, that we're doing that in a way that we're actually attacking where the need is, no matter where it is in the state that we actually understand the complex relationships between unincorporated townships, cities, um, uh, uh, counties. So I just think it's important as we continue to have that conversation, no matter what the intent of the federal government, arbitrary numbers of cities and sizes. But when I keep talking to people, and the last thing I will bring in is the idea of the disproportionality to who's affected in this. And right now we know that people are congregate living uh, facilities are really getting hit hard. The other data that's starting to come in around the country and even our country is that people of color because of their uh, health disparities and their comorbidities are really handling that. And that those um, are concentrated in all parts of our state, not just in the metro, uh, depending upon where the work or the jobs are. Um, when we talk about the meatpacking plants and others, many of us know people of color and others are living there and they're the ones that are suffering. Uh, from the issue. So I just want to make sure, and I want to really thank Senator Rosen uh, for bringing this up in a robust discussion, but wanted to make sure that we understood the difference between equity and equality. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, we certainly have a ways to go. There's no question about it, uh, Senator Hayden. And be nimble. Don't fall off that cliff and end up in the San Francisco Bay there. Well, you know, I, I was trying to do my best there. The fog is coming in about this time of day, so <laughs> I got to get out of here. It's a beautiful spot. Senator Cohen. Uh, Mr. Chairman, very quickly, uh, the thing I forgot to mention is, is that uh, uh, you'll find that some of the cities listed uh, don't have a need for I would guess any money where they don't necessarily have a hospital within the city, uh, services are provided elsewhere. And, and again, that just reflects on, on where the formula might might go a little bit astray. Uh, I also do have an amendment that I wanna mention as, as you get to the end of the discussion. Okay. Senator Champion, and I guess we're- Yes, I do have a question. Um, maybe this is to nonpartisan staff or uh, to the author. I've heard several people uh, on the line talk about the uh, being responsible for the administrative work for those that it makes an allocation to, namely Hennepin and Ramsey County. Is that true? And if so, uh, do we make uh, any um, uh, uh, arrangements in order for them to um, to have to deal with that because that that would include some liability that would also include some adi uh, some additional work and are we comfortable if this is true for them to uh, be required to do an unfunded mandate that's my uh, first question and then to Mr. Mossman who talked about um, uh, you know being thoughtful in order to make sure that there's not a shift to the property tax payers uh, and so I just want him to e elaborate on that and not nuance it and kind of be clear with me because I was really curious as to how that would happen and, 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 and whether he's talking about that would happen in the event that some local municipality had an inability to um, uh, repay money that they may, may probably have spent inappropriately. And then therefore there would be a levy and then a pr uh, property tax increase. So okay. if Mr. Mossman can answer that and then nonpartisan staff can ask the question about the administrative is the question. Mr. Mossman first, go ahead, thank you. Mr. Mr. Mossman, Chair and members, there we go. I'm trying to get unmuted. Um, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, my reference was not uh, really to the potential inappropriate use of funds, although I think generically we as uh, local government associations are very concerned and just want to work closely with the author and uh, the administration and all of you as this legislation goes forward and as it's implemented, frankly, um, to make sure that we are communicating the administrative process and needs of local governments to minimize um, or prevent entirely any potential for that to happen. I just think that would be uh, bad for Minnesota and the money needs to be spent um, where it's needed. So my reference to the property taxes um, really was just the, the notion that the funding to counties in particular, um, because I think counties have a lot of uh, front end costs here that are directly related to the COVID response in terms of the human services um, and the public safety, as well as uh, law enforcement in, in other areas, that those costs should not, that, that are COVID related should not exceed, they, sh they need to get the allocation and the pot of money that goes to counties needs to be um, reflective of the role of, of counties. And I think that's true for cities also. Um, reflective of the role and responsibilities they have such that they're not incurring costs that eventually need to be paid by property taxpayers because this allocation is inadequate. And so whatever mechanisms are put in place, whether it's a single formula on the front end or a formula on the front end plus a holdback um, to cover those un, you know, unexpected and additional costs on the back end, I just think the my final point is the whole premise, I think, of the stabilization money was is to prevent um, the COVID situation from adding to local government burdens. Okay. And Mr. Arneson. Mr. Chair, with your permission, I think I might oh, sure. Mr. Handle, handle that question. Um, so Senator Champion asked the question related to some of the testimony earlier about whether there are burdens on the part of the direct distributed local counties, uh, Hennepin and Ramsey, and whether they have direct responsibility for um, under the language of the bill, tracking um, or ensuring that the local governments 
in fact, are, um, are appropriately spending the money. Like has been mentioned in many different cases on throughout this meeting, the guidance is continuing. The guidance is not quite yet clear. What we do know is what the law says, and in that particular circumstance, it says that the Inspector General of the Department of Treasury determines that a state, tribal government, or local government has failed to comply with subsection D, and that's the use of the money, then an amount equal to the amount of funds used in violation shall be booked as a debt against such entity. So I think an argument can be made that, um, that um, it could go to the local government as being responsible. Um, I think it could, uh, the, the administrative burden could fall to the state and, or the, the administrative burden, the logic flows uh, that the counties used was that um, that, that burden would uh, accrue to the counties if they had to distribute to their local governments. But I think this, like many other things, is one of those items that we're looking for further guidance on. And uh, Treasury did say today that they're hoping within the next two weeks to have another set of guidance on the Q&As that we hope will illuminate this matter as well as many others. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, with that being said, I would ask Senate Council to help me with a potential amendment uh, because I would like to uh, have an amendment that says that any, um, any uh, liability uh, that, that the counties, that Hennepin or, or, or Ramsey County receives as a result of, of carrying out the mandated functions to distribute money to um, local municipalities, if that, that uh, uh, requires or, or yeah, if that requires the local, the, the counties to be held responsible for those funds, any burden on the counties will be shifted to the state and, and that the state will, will, will reimburse them for that or will pay for it. That's something that, that I'm thinking. Uh, and then the other question is uh, to the author, what's your th thinking if we're not in session, how are we going to, what mechanism is gonna be in place for those funds to be potentially redistributed if there's any money in, in, in place. Senator Rosen, uh, I'm not sure how you wanna handle this. So should we give staff a little bit of time to, uh, to uh, craft this amendment? I know Senator Cohen uh, wanted to either discuss offline or talk about a, an amendment that he might've had, but uh, Senator Rosen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And yes, I, I know we are, um, getting very close to our allotted time here. Um, and Mr. Chair and Senator Champion, I, I, several people have said to me that we need to see your face when you were talking and offering an amendment. So if you could uh, please uh, turn your- There you go, I'm sorry. Thank you very much, appreciate that. Um, so to your question of if, when the funds come back, and they are, there is time to a lot. I think we're going to have to deal with that by either the governor calling us in, or perhaps the governor has um, allotted money that um, is, um, you know, a set amount of money in this fund that he can be nimble with too. But um, yeah, it, we, you know, it, session's going to end here next week, and there's a tremendous amount of money to go on. And I still think it's the legislators, the 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 legis the this this appropriation needs to be done by law and that's uh something that we're going to have to deal with with the governor so we may potentially what you're saying senator if if senator we don't Chapman. make uh, us senator rosen make uh the appropriate arrangements that we could potentially not be called back in session and money that could potentially be used by some other county city or local municipality may run the risk of, of going back to the federal government. And I would be a little concerned about that. But Senator Rosen, how would you like to deal with my potential amendment? Should we give me a little time or what would you like to do? Because I know time is, is running short. Senator Rosen. Um, uh, perhaps Mr. Bodern or Mr. Nauman can explain um, what that amendment does or re reiterate it, please. Um, Ms. Mr. Chair, mm -hmm. Senator Rosen, and uh, Senator Champion, perhaps we could ask maybe a little bit of clarification. I was just writing to Mr. Bodder to clarify whether he had heard the same thing I heard, which was, were you wanting the county to be reimbursed for admi any administrative burden that accrues to them, or were you assuming that cities 
and and the one township in in uh, Ramsey County would uh, essentially use the the state uh, system, whatever that system may be, um, that all that will occur in all the other eighty five counties. Do, do you understand the distinction? That yes, I, I do. I am. You are asking me, uh, do do I want the language to say that any allocation that needs to go to those local municipalities that are within the boundaries of Hennepin and Ramsey County, that the administrative responsibility will fall on the state in order to do that? Or uh, am I asking for any of the, uh, uh, am I asking that any costs incurred by Hennepin and Ramsey County to carry out what's mandated in this uh proposal um, around distri around dis distributing funds and reporting and doing all that other stuff in the event that a county or local municipality doesn't do what they're supposed to do um, or spends the money inappropriately and I levied a fee uh, as a result of it that the burden of that fee would pass on to the state and will not be at the um, uh, and it would not lay in the lap of the uh, uh, local municipality or Hennepin or Ramsey County. That is what I want more than anything else. Um, and I'm also not sure if uh, if uh, Senator Cohen might have an amendment that could alleviate this problem uh, if if uh, he's going to make a motion to uh, delete subdivision seven. Senator, you know, I'm going to go back to Senator Cohen. I know he, he talked about an amendment. I don't know if he had one or, or wanted to talk about one. Senator Cohen? Um, Mr. Chairman, um, I have an amendment that I believe is prepared, and, and that simply, uh, to be fair, just uh, eliminates Hennepin and Ramsey. But if Mr. Arneson had prepared it. I actually don't have a copy of the amendment itself in front of me at this point. I'll wait till uh, it's posted, but I think it should be ready. The A3 amendment to the A2 amendment. Do I have that correctly? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Bodden or Mr. Chairman and Senator Cohen. So we haven't done this yet in the finance committee. I will be emailing all of the members, the A3 amendment, which was prepared for Senator Cohen. So mm -hmm. check your email, your Senate email address for this, um, this amendment. And Mr. Biden, can you also put, um, work on my potential amendment just in case this amendment doesn't go on? Uh, Senator Champion, I'll do my best. I think just restating briefly um, what you wanted to accomplish was to ensure, I mean, one way to accomplish um, preventing Ramsey and Hennepin counties from being held liable, perhaps by the federal government for funds spent improperly by subunits of government would be to make them um, uh, equal participants uh, or to allow them to avail themselves of subdivision eight, uh, the mechanism used to recapture improperly spent federal funds. Um, that's one thought that occurred to me. It's kind of a complex uh, problem. Okay, so members, this is getting a little, a little confusing here. We've got an awful lot for uh, staff to be dealing with uh, and we've got very little time left here. So, uh, I guess the, the, the amendment that's prepared is Senator Cohen's. Does everybody have a copy of that amendment? Oh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'd move the amendment. Senator Cohen moves the, what is it, A3 amendment? I believe it's the A3 right. amendment. Okay. Mr. Bowden, is it? For, for discussion, yes. uh, for discussion, Senator so, uh, Rosen. Uh, thank sorry. you. Senator Cohen, discussion on your amendment. Yeah, so Mr. Chairman, very quickly, what it does is it, it changes um, the definition in kind of a non-threatening way, but the bulk of the amendment uh, indicates, uh, states that uh, Hennepin Ramsey counties are not eligible for the aid distribution formula as presented in Senator Rosen's bill, but nothing uh, in the legislation or in, in the proposed legislation would be construed to require Hennepin and Ramsey to uh, pay out of their share uh, any other eligible determinations uh, uh, in Senator Rosen's legislation. Senator so it, it excludes Hennepin and Ramsey, but doesn't ex exclude their cities. Okay, Senator Rosen to the amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I don't have the amendment up before me, but I'm just listening to to the uh, contents of it. And I would have to say um, that the the whole premise of this bill is to try to 
um, keep, keep everything equal throughout the state. And here we're peeling out Hennepin and Ramsey and setting them aside. And I think that is uh, something that does create the haves and have nots and a lot of hurt feelings on this. So I will have to say no to this amendment. And Mr. Chair, I do have to remind you, we're, we're fast approaching two and a half hours um, of this committee. So we probably, um, you know, if there are further amendments, perhaps we can save them for the floor. But at this point, I'm gonna have to say no to this amendment. Okay. Mr. Chair, I'd like to call for a roll call on the amendment. You'd like a roll call? Okay. Uh, will the uh, secretary speak? On the amendment. Real quickly on the amendment. I don't see your hand. Is your hand up? I'm sorry. I, I raised it right, right now. Um, I've been trying to listen to this um, very important, complicated bill. Uh, but this, I think, uh, goes to the premise of local control. Uh, I think Canop and, and Ramsey deserve and need the local control at this point, particularly with everything that's been said already with uh, the testifiers, um, Commissioner Callison and Commissioner um, uh, uh, Carter. I, I think uh, it really does have to go back to local control. Um, I can communicate it to my own um, cities and I got response from one of them of how much money they've spent so far. Their allocation just for Edina is they're getting um, and under the formula that's supposed to be equitable uh, that's the tune of $4.5 million. And um, I asked them how much they've spent in the sake of obvious transparency. Senator, and Senator, to the amendment. This is my point. Um, they, they're spending, um, they've spent so far in preparedness 200 million, but there's a, a much more expense of what they have lost for the revenue piece. Uh, every city is going to be different. Uh, they have heavy, heavy, um, you know, reliance on fees on, on many of their public uh, facilities. Ramsey, um, in Hennepin County in particular, okay. has HCMC. That's a very unique situation and a huge asset to our state. Uh, I think this amendment is appropriate to give them back that local control so they can, we've been on a call with Hennepin County for every single week to deal with the situation, all the delegation. Senator, that, that point has been made very strongly here. We're gonna to have to vote on this amendment right now. Well, so. let, I will I will wrap up, but I, I've been very courteous of not speaking out of the entire hearing, two and a half hearing, so I can at least get my five minutes in. Um, and I've avoided to, to, to be redundant, but I do think that I need to speak to this uh, amendment because I think it it, it creates that, that balance uh, of having these two counties disproportionately handling uh, a huge caseload and, and preparedness and, and dealing with COVID on many, many fronts from long-term care. Department. Uh, I think this amendment is not just uh, fair, um, but also uh, to use Senator Rosen's um, term, it's also equitable. Uh, that's why the federal government did it this way, recognizing that in some, some cases uh, it, it's better to have uh, this particular approach and, and they are spending the money in, in appropriate ways and, and they are already, as you can know about their finances are, are varied in dire straits. So I think the amendment is, is fair and equitable. I support it and I hope uh, committee members uh, agree. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. 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 Chair. Mr. Chair, I'd like to say something to this. Um, I wanna make sure that the mm. members realize that um, Senator Cohen's amendment uh, uses a proration language in subdivision nine to reduce all the formulas. And this would reduce the formulas um, for all cities and towns to pay for Hennepin and Ramsey to keep their money. And this would be about a 20 to 25% reduction to cities and towns. And as far as being um, local control, there is nothing without this legislation that guarantees Hennepin and Ramsey or any of the counties would share their money with the cities and towns. So we are guarantee guaranteeing that everybody is going to be treated equally. The formula will be different because of the amount of population in the city or a county or a town or the amount, but basically it all comes out to $174.50 per head. And so I definitely want everybody to realize that this is um, with this amendment, Hennepin County and, and Ramsey County will be getting, will be double dipping. Senator Cohen, real quickly, and then we're going to vote. 
Well, Mr. Chairman, I, we've had a long discussion um, about this and appreciate the time of the committee. I, as I've indicated, there are inequities in, in, in I understand what Senator Rosen is attempting to do, obviously. Uh, there are inequities in, in how this is being presented. And I think we've heard in particular from uh, Commissioner Callison and Commissioner Carter as to what's happening within Hennepin and Ramsey, which are uh, the, the, at the center, both in terms of, of population, in terms of uh, the medical issues uh, involving uh, uh, Hennepin and Ramsey, uh, in terms of, of what is centered. And, and we've heard it in the reverse from members who have said, there's not a problem in my area of the state. So I think, uh, you know, the, the juxtaposition with my amendment recognizes a little bit of that and says, fine, okay, you, you made your case on that, we made our case on the other. So if there's equity on one side, there should be equity on the other side. Okay, hearing that, uh, Senator Cohen renews the A3 amendment. We're gonna, we're gonna vote, uh, um, recorded vote. Ruth, go ahead. Yes, Senator Rosen. Yes, or no, excuse me. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, That's fine with me. Senator uh, Ingerbritson? No. Senator Cohen? Yes. Senator Benson? No. Senator Champion? Yes. Senator Franzen? Yes. Senator Hayden? Aye. Senator Kiffmeyer? Senator Kiffmeyer, you're muted, I think. No. Okay. Senator Limmer? I'm sorry, you're muted, sir. Senator no. Limmer? No. Senator Marty? Senator Nelson? No. I mean, no. <laughs> no. Senator Newman? Senator Westrom? No. Senator Ingerbritz and I will be texting you the total. Thank you. Okay, members, uh, with regards to the A3 amendment, uh, after the roll call, there were four yeses, seven noes. The amendment is not agreed upon. Uh, I have an amendment. Senator Champion. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would like to move to delete uh, uh, subdivision seven. Would staff uh, help us with that? I guess it's pretty straightforward. Yes, and what I'll do is the other amendment that I uh, was seeking to have done, uh, if it's okay, I'll just deal with that one tomorrow on the floor when the bill comes up. But for tonight, I would just like to do a straightforward amendment. Thank you, Senator Champion. And Senator Hayden, a motion has been made. To, would you like to discuss to, to the motion? Oh, uh, no, I think it's straightforward. I'd also like to roll call it, uh, Mr. Chair. Very good. Seeing no other discussion on the champion Mr. amendment. Mr. Chair. I'm sorry, Senator Rosen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would, I'd like to say that this is important to keep this subdivision seven in there to guarantee that the cities, uh, which Edina would get $4,570,000 under this uh, formula uh, to make sure that the cities and towns receive um, their appropriate allotment for per head that they are required to get. So I would vote no on this, this amendment. And Mr. Chair, can I just speak to the amendment? Real quickly, yep. Uh, in response to the uh, uh, great Senator there, I would say that it would be appropriate for us to delete subdivision seven. Um, um, I think that uh, uh, the cities like Edina can still get an allotment that could be done through a much more equitable and fair formula. 
uh, where the uh, uh, remaining dollars can be spread out in a way where others would receive it uh, on a need basis uh, and a more pro appropriate basis. So I, so I wouldn't want to set it up as if uh, Edina cannot and would not receive any money if we were to do the right thing under this bill and do a different formula. I think that it would be much more fair and equitable. Thank you. So, and um, Ms. Uh, Redwig, go ahead and uh, call the roll. Okay, Senator Rosen. No. Senator Ingebrigtsen. No. Senator Cohen. Yes. Senator Benson. No. Senator Champion. Yes. Senator Franzen. Yes. Senator Hayden. Aye. Senator Kiffmeyer. No. Senator Limmer. No. Senator Marty. Senator Nelson. No. Senator Newman. Senator Westrom. No. Senator Ingerbritz and I will text you the totals. Thank you. Is Senator Marty not on the call? Because I because whenever his name has been called, I have not heard a vote from him. Oh, I don't see him. Um, I could ask the host if the host sees. Uh, Senator Champion, this is Jessica. I have not seen Senator Marty for the last um, half hour or so. He was, on, he was on to start with, I know, yeah. And, and apparently Senator Newman's not present either, is it? That's correct. Okay, the tally is in uh, on the um, champion amendment. Uh, I do have, I lost it on my phone here real quick. Uh, with, on a total, or on a vote of seven no's and four yeses, the amendment does not prevail. And one last question, oh, Mr. Chair, I'd just like to know if this bill is gonna go to taxes seeing that there's a potential levy. Senator Rosen, to that, and then we're going to vote. Uh, this, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Champion. It has not been requested by the tax committee. Okay. Thank you, Madam. Uh, thank you, Senator Rosen. Senator Hayden, I see your hand still up. Mr. I guess not. No, no, Mr. Chair, I don't know how to put it down, but I'll, I'll put it down now. Okay. <laughs> Be careful. Senator Rosen. Mr. Chair, uh, I would like to make some closing comments. Sure, please. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I first like to thank um, the nonpartisan staff who worked on this bill for the last uh, almost two weeks, and they have done an outstanding job with this. And this clearly, uh, members, is not a, um, a partisan bill at all. It is a it's a fair, equitable bill, and. Um, we are, Minnesota is way ahead of other states. Other states are uh, grappling with how to get a, um, this disbursement out among their, their um, counties equally. And this is what we are, we're doing. We tried to create a bill that didn't create winners and losers. Absolutely not. And I know that um, there's a lot of discussion about the cities of first class, the Hennepin and Ramsey County, that they should be treated differently. But we, I feel, and I hope you feel too, that all counties should be treated the same. And that one isn't any more special than the others. And every person should be treated the same. And that we don't put a higher amount on, on a person's head just because they live in a geographic area. So there, there are some areas that have been hit harder. But that doesn't preclude the fact that other areas are going to have harder hit or are, are, are going to be a hot spot at some point. And as I said, there's 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 um, the pressures on the public health and the first responders. It, it's going to vary um, depending on how many cases you have throughout the state. And I know um, and I'm very sensitive about some of the um, the. Um, pressures of Hennepin County, especially HCMC. Uh, I do know that HCMC is receiving 19 million from the Public Health and Social Services Emergency Fund. So there are pots of money coming from the feds to address these specific cases. 
Also, there's another fund, uh, the COVID-19 High Impact Fund, where there's $2 billion going to hospitals for uncompensated care. So that'll be $49.5 million for our three systems in the state, and that'll be HCMC, Fairview, and Regions. Um, so it's really impossible, I know, members to, to um, predict the next outbreak or hotspot. And, and I, I'm just a little taken back by the characterization that this, this is an overreach bill. This is about as fair and equitable as you can get, because we are not pitting winners, people that, that received uh, um, you know, more, more cases than the other ones, because it's going to be across the state as the governor is predicting and as we are preparing in all aspects. So um, I think it's fair and I, I ask for your support and I, I look forward to getting this signed by the governor. Senator, uh, seeing no more discussion, would you like to move your bill? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move Senate file 4564 as amended, be recommended, passed and sent to general orders. Okay, members, um, we'll ask that you unmute. Show yourselves. Oh, let's see, make sure we're all there. I'll ask the host if it looks like everybody's ready to go. Just about. <laughs> yep. Okay, all in favor, say aye. Raise your hand. Say aye. Aye. Oh, same sign. No. 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 The motion prevails. Members, Senator Rosen, do you have anything further for your? Uh... No, thank you very much, members. That was a that was a marathon uh, hearing. I really appreciate it. It was a very good discussion. Um, um, very valid, and I totally understand your concerns. And and we will continue to work on this bill as we are um, as we as it approaches the floor. Thank you very much. Okay, members, the Senate, so, Finance, Senate Finance Committee uh, stands Mr. Adjourned. Chairman. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Senator, I'm, I'm sorry. Just a, a little bit of a letter note, Senator Rosen, Mr. Chairman, Senator Rosen. Uh, appreciate your work on this. I know you're concerned about the time. These are unusual circumstances. I just want to point out, uh, as I include my work on the Finance Committee, that uh, your predecessor three times removed Senator Miriam had no hesitation to run meetings until about 6, 6.30 on Saturdays um, during the session and more than once during a session. So you haven't, you might be concerned about the time. You have not in any way equaled Senator Miriam. Uh, Mr. Chair. Senator Rosen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Cohen. I have, um, I have leadership breathing down my neck and a bunch of people waiting for a caucus right now. So thank you. Okay, though. all right. <laughs> all right. With that, uh, members, we stand adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you.